good morning. My name is Terry MacArthur. I'm with Woodlands Township Environmental Services. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, another great workshop. Today we're going to dive a little deeper into the problem of invasive species, some of the reasons why we don't want them in our ecosystems and environments and ways to get involved in helping reduce their numbers. Um, before we get started, I do want to give a shout out to Kathy Herrick. I see she's already in our group this morning. Uh, she is our lead volunteer for our local invasives task force. And I thought I'd let you all know that uh, just this month, just in August, while we're in all this heat and humidity, that um, Kathy and her group have Kathy and her group have already put in nearly 70 hours uh, removing tons of air potato vines and um, freeing from that captivity a number of our invasive species, I mean our native species from these invasives. So they're out there every day fighting the fight. And so many of you who are registered today asked to be notified of work days. So I'm just letting you know you uh, may get an email from Kathy Herrick asking you if you want to join. Uh, if you do want to join the group on any given work day, there's Kathy. Hi, Kathy. If you do want to join the group on any given work day, just be sure to respond and let Kathy know. We are still trying to keep work group sizes small. So it's helpful if you respond and let her know that you intend to show up so she can limit the number of folks in the group. So um, just to get us started this morning, then let me introduce our instructor for the day. She's Ashley Morgan Olvera. She's the director of research, education and outreach for the Texas Invasive Species Institute up at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville. She has presented other programs for us and I am so thrilled that she makes herself available on an ongoing basis to do some regular trainings for our group. Um, we're more than 120 individuals strong now who are participating in uh, the Invasives Task Force work. And a lot of it is, th is in thanks to Ashley's instructions that have helped us realize all the problems going on. So um, uh, we'll be taking some breaks. Ashley will guide us to those breaks. And I want to let you know, as Ashley presents today, if you have a question, type it into the chat box. And uh, toward the end of the training today, we'll address those questions. Ashley will be available to answer them. So uh, your questions will only be seen by Ashley or me. Um, so just type them into the chat box and we'll make that work toward the end. Um, Ashley, if you are ready, uh, why don't you talk to us about invasive species and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Terry. Good morning, everybody. We really appreciate you taking your morning to learn about invasive species. As Terry talked about, we're going to go a little bit more in depth talking about what they are, ones that are in your area, how you can report and manage them as well using texasinvasives.org. So with that, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and get the presentation going for y'all. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Thank you. 
All right, so good morning again. This is gonna be talking specifically, we have a citizen scientist program through texasinvasives.org that the Woodlands Township has been really involved with. It's called the Invaders of Texas. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Also invasive species identification, management and reporting. My name is Ashley Morgan Olvera. And as Terry said, I'm the research director and also the director of education and outreach for the Texas Invasive Species Institute. So the Texas Invasive Species Institute focuses on early detection and rapid response to newly invasive species and enhance public education about invasive species. So much like texasinvasives.org, TISI, we've always been a sister institution and worked alongside because both of our entities always believed that public education really is the best way for us to make progress in this battle against invasive species. We need all hands on deck, all boots on the ground. So we work with groups of all ages and um, we have now acquired so now we are a one-stop shop for your invasive species needs texas invasive species institute is texas invasives again everyone always thought we were related again we were sister entities we tended to tissy tended to focus more on animals texas invasive focused more on invasive plants together now we're trying to build up all of the reporting capabilities at texasinvasives.org to help provide more information for you and allow you to report information back to us as well in regards to where invasive species are found our website texasinvasives.org is a great website for if you want to know what kind of invasive plants, pests, insects are in Texas, you can always go there and it does provide management strategies as well, which we will discuss a few later. So I always like to start first with a thanks to our funding opportunities. Parks and Wildlife, USDA APHIS, which is the invasive species branch of the USDA, the Texas A&M Forest Service, the TIPC, Texas Invasive Plant and Pest Council, and Sam Houston State University have all allowed this um, amazing entity to continue after 16 years. So today, kind of touched a little bit on it, but just to outline it for you here, we're going to talk general concepts and background, starting from the very beginning. What is an invasive species? Why do we battle them? And how can we best prepare ourselves to, one, prevent the establishment of invasive species and to further protect our habitats? We'll talk about the citizen scientist program. At the end of this, you'll be able to register. This will count as a full citizen scientist training. So you will now be included as an invader of Texas in the program if you wish to register with the link will be at the end. We'll talk about other pests that are found on the Sentinel Pest Network. We'll go over some local invasive plant identification, including the air potato, which um, the Woodlands Township and Hartwood invaders do amazing work removing that. Every It seems like every month they're doing amazing things, and we truly appreciate it. It's great to see those before and after photos as well. And we'll also talk about how you can report invasive species to us through our platform. So think about it before we get into the federal definition and you know you don't have to type anything into a chat but think about what what do you perceive as an invasive species how do you define it and then what are characteristics when you know something's an an invasive species like what's that one characteristic that you always think of when it comes to them and so we're just going to think on it for a minute and then we'll go to the federal definition so if we think about the timeline of invasive species were defined in this executive order by Bill Clinton in 1999. So if we think about the fact that we're in 2021, invasive species have only had a federal definition for 22 years. So this is stuff that's really started to pick up in the past 30 years. We've spent a lot of time 
making mistakes and now we're trying to correct them but by identifying an invasive species that's one way that we can start but just kind of think about that in the timeline as things once we start talking about what an invasive species is and give some examples you'll start to realize oh well we didn't even put a name on this till 20 years ago that might be why we're a little bit behind on things. So an invasive species, the really important thing to note is that it's a species that's non-native to the ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. It's red and bolded there. It needs to cause harm. It's not just an invasive species because it's exotic. Think about all our European honeybee. That's not an invasive species, but it's exotic. Our 98% of our agricultural crops are non-native. So it must cause harm to be an invasive species. If it becomes naturalized, thinking about our ligustrum plants, Brazilian pepper tree, right? A lot of these ornamental plants, some of them stay ornamental and some of them are invasive plants. So it's coming down to remember it needs to cause harm, right? Just because it's exotic doesn't mean that's an invasive species. Some terms that you might hear that could be kind of confusing, right? Exotic, introduced, non-native, alien, weed. So a lot of these can be intertwined with an invasive species definition, but a non-native species is not always an invasive species, right? Again, think about our European honeybee. That's a non-native species, but our ecosystems have now become, you know, dependent on it to where we're protecting our European honeybees, right? So we would never classify it as an invasive species. It benefits our ecosystem, doesn't cause any harm. So it's important to kind of think about the differences between these, right? An introduced species can be an invasive species. Often invasive species are introduced, but that doesn't mean every introduced species is an invasive species, right? It's one of those, one is one, but not always the other. So why, right, we were, why do we battle invasive species? Well, the, the big thing is harm, but harm can come in many different facets. The first one that we'll talk about is the harm to the environment that invasive species pose. So a lot of them um, can have genetic or individual impacts. They can hybridize with native species. They can change the morphology of plants. They can change the behavior of organisms. They can also, so they, the obviously they cause like competition and predation, nutritional, physical disease impacts. So if you think about an invasive species, if it's coming, that means that it's causing harm, right? So harm can be it's out competing our native species. It's predating on our native species. It provides no nutritional value, right? So a lot of our invasive plants, if you think about them invading a rangeland, right? The cattle now no longer have something of the same nutritional value. That has a significant environmental impact not only yes we're talking about the rangelands but think about all of those other species that live on those rangelands the lizards the birds the insects are they getting the same nutritional value from that invasive plant and then of course invasive species can always transmit diseases think about our asian tiger mosquito mosquitoes in general transmit diseases but then you have the asian tiger mosquito that's able to transmit even more diseases right Right? So there's a lot of environmental impacts that one invasive species can pose. They can also, you know, interrupt species composition, lower biodiversity, nutria here up in the right hand corner. They come out as soon as they are born, they are able to start consuming wetland grasses, which is mainly what they eat. They eat reeds and canes and a lot of those wetland plants, and they can eat up to two to five pounds a day. So that's as soon as they come out, those little 
cubs, I don't know, pups, maybe nutria pups can go right away and they start clearing away the wetlands, causing erosion issues and, and obviously ruining the habitat for numerous animals. You have the lionfish. We'll talk a little bit more on them in a bit, but the lionfish has a voracious appetite. It has no predator over here in its spines. <clears throat> there's parapolitic venom in their spines. We don't have any predators that are adapted to serve, to be able to want to eat a lionfish more than once, right? They may survive the venom, but are they going to eat it again? Not so much. And the problem is that lionfish will eat anything smaller than them. So they have a voracious appetite that can also lower biodiversity. So there's a lot of, again, environmental impacts that various species, plants, and pests can pose. They can reduce soil health. They can mess with hydrology, touched on how they can cause erosion, right? You have um, giant reed can cause more erosion events because their, their root systems don't hold together the soil like what they're used to. So it can just mess everything up. Giant salvinia can remove aquatic nutrients, completely smother lakes. So that impacts the entire environment going on below it. One example, so the environmental impacts of the Chinese privet, it replaces natives, right? It's, a, it's very aggressive in its ability to grow and take over an area, so it replaces natives. It competes for pollinators, right? If, if it's getting pollinated and those native plants aren't, then that's also helping this ligustrum reproduce and continue on. It competes for seed dispersers as well. It changes the soil chemistry and nutrient cycling. It, it changes the soil arthropod community as well because certain insects are adapted to certain plants. And if you start getting a monoculture of one type of plant, that's also going to change. You know, what if the earthworms aren't as happy with a, a privet in their yard? That I don't know, but it's things to think about as well. They can have negative impacts on what's going on below the ground and negative impacts on our fungi community. So soil fungi that are necessary to help break down and get those soil nutrients out into our plants, ligustrum can also have negative effects on that. So that's how one species can attack and pose harm in several different ways. And also impacts our stream communities as well. It can start changing the pH and messing with the soil nutrients, which then messes with all of the insects that visit the creek, et cetera. So we talked a lot about environmental impacts, but there are also non-environmental impacts that we need to worry about as well. So invasive species, can affect almost every facet of our existence, if you want to think about it. They can impact our recreation, our human health, our animals' health, industry, um, the agriculture. We have crop pests. We have plants that can take over crop fields. You know, these pests can cause 0% crop yield, which means the farmers made nothing off of that, they can impact our forest industry by threatening our lumber and also protecting the, our forest ecosystems and our natural heritage. And all of this affects our economy, right? So they can affect almost every facet. Economic harm is the one that really gets a lot of traction. It's because it costs a lot of money to manage invasive species, especially once they're here. We, that's why we're trying to focus more on early detection and rapid response because on a lot of these species, we're behind the ball because if you think about it, definitions of this stuff didn't start coming up until about 30 years ago. So some examples, control of the Burmese python alone in Florida costs them at almost a million dollars annually. The Asian carp barrier took 30 million to build and it's $18 million a year to maintain it. 
Emerald ash borer, one of our most infamous invasive species, costs $10.7 billion. That's to the cost of tree treatments, tree removal, and then having to replace the trees that they've killed. That costs about $10 billion a year. In Texas, our invasive aquatic species, so that's anything from zebra mussels to hydrilla, right? Invasive aquatic species. That can cost an estimated 17 million in lost property value. And then the, our legislature allocates about $10 million a year. And that's just on invasive aquatic species, right? We're not talking about the terrestrial ones. So in Texas alone, it can cost about $10 million. And that's <clears throat> and that's just to manage some of the species in that, right? That, the, that wouldn't allow for treatment of all invasive aquatic species. So it costs a lot of money to safeguard our natural habitats from invasive species and or remove them. And as the Heartwood invaders in the Woodland Township can attest, I mean, it takes a lot of time and effort as well. So they also threaten our human health, social and recreational aspects. So like what I had touched on, you've got the Asian tiger mosquito. It's able to transmit West Nile virus and SARS. It was able to transmit that where our native mosquitoes, our native mosquitoes are nasty enough. They can transmit enough diseases. It's just that oftentimes these species can bring diseases with them, right? just much like humans can bring sickness with them. Insects, plant, or not, well, yeah, plants can bring pathogens with them as well, right? There are things that are brought with them. You've got this um, invasive black slug here, which we'll talk a little bit more about as well. It can transmit parasites to humans and mammals. And then you've got um, salvinia and those that they impact our sport fishing, our boating, um, they limit our outdoor activities and also, you know, it impedes our aesthetics if, you know, if these species are taking over an area that people pay to dock their boat there, but now nobody's going out on the lake, right? There's all of these other kind of trickle down effects where if, if one part of the industry stops, what else does it affect as well? And we have to focus on, it impacts our international travel. That's why we have customs set up. That's why they ask you to declare things when you come through is they're trying to prevent the spread of more of these species. And we'll talk about one of those, which I'm sure you heard about on the news a couple of weeks ago. So this is that campaign from Parks and Wildlife in coordination with TexasInvasives.org. Hello, giant salvinia, goodbye, Texas lakes, which is exactly why what is happening and what we're trying to prevent. One species alone can completely destroy an area, right? The emerald ash borer, which we talked about already costs about $10 billion. And that was a couple of years ago. So it easily could be $12 billion now to manage in the United States. This is what they're also having to correct. So this is in Ohio, the exact same street, just three years apart. This, these are ash trees before the invasive emerald ash borer showed up. These are the ash trees following that three years later. They're all completely dead. And the really ironic thing about it is this street was previously uh, filled with oak trees that had died from oak wilt, so which is also an invasive pathogen. So it's one of those things that city landscapers and all of those, they're having to start think about, thinking about these things as well. Should they be planting monocultures anymore, right? To replace things, right? If this was all oak trees and they died and they had to pull them and then they planted all these ash trees, well, then they died and they had to pull them. If we have to think about the impacts were they providing a thoroughfare for the emerald ash borer, right? You're, you're providing tons of host plants as well. 
which can help the beetles spread faster. But this shows just the significant impact that one tiny little beetle can have. And the, on this one street alone, think about the costs that it would to, because you have to mulch and remove all of those trees to make sure that you're killing the beetles that are still inside. So there's a lot of repair that they have to do to this area again. So sometimes an invasive species can threaten different facets, right? They don't just have to threaten environmental or human health or economic threat. Sometimes they can threaten all facets if they want to. One example is the red imported fire ant. So it has environmental impacts because it's able to attack ground dwelling animals. Uh, we might have heard. Um, I know that I hear about how red imported fire ants have had negative impacts on our uh, horned lizard populations, our armadillos, our quails. I mean, you name it. If it's a ground dwelling animal, fire ants have had an impact on it because they're really aggressive predators. On that, they they disrupt the soil arthropod community, they displace native ants, so they have that environmental threat, but then they also have the economic threat where they are crop pests. They will destroy corn, soybean, blueberry, cabbage crops, and in Texas alone, the fire ant can cost $500 million a year to manage, and that means um, treating the livestock, the wildlife, the public health damages that the insect has caused, $500 million a year on one insect. And then it does pose a health, uh, harm to our health, including our animals and ourselves, especially if you end up being very allergic to a red fire ant bite, much like it happens with people allergic to honeybees, they could cause anaphylactic shock in you. But fire ants, if enough of them bite you, they can kill you. Their venom will get, I mean, that, that's exactly how they attack and feed. So this one insect poses a variety of threats of harm. So we talked about, so not only does an invasive species cause harm, and we talked about the different ways that they can cause harm, an invasive species also needs to spread, increase in size, right? If it, if it just caused harm, but stayed in one area, that would actually be pretty easy to manage. I mean, if you think about if you had like one really bad bully that's trying to come for you, but their feet are rooted in the ground and they can't go anywhere, well, then it'd be really easy to get the bully out of the area. So that's the threat is not only do these things cause harm, they spread really, really quickly. They increase in population size. And that's usually because they, um, they have high reproduction. They rep make a lot of offspring, they begin reproduction really early. Some of these species, um, you could think about starting reproduction earlier, say that they're able to start reproducing at one years when our native species can only reproduce at three years. Well, then that invasive species has two whole years earlier to reproduce. Sometimes, so like the lionfish is a perfect example low mortality rate because they don't have a lot of enemies, right? They have these parapolitic spines. So yeah, there's videos of groupers eating them and a grouper could totally eat one of those fish, but is it going to eat it more than once? Is it going to want to expose itself to that venom again more than once? So that's a lot of the problem is they have a lot of reproduction and not as much death. So that allows them to spread really, really quickly. So just give me a minute, I'm gonna close my blinds. I'm sure you'll see the sun coming on my face really. All right, there we go. So the lionfish, it's still a very popular animal in the pet industry. It's a gorgeous animal, however, um, 
so if you also look at this timeline, right, all of this is kind of before we put a federal definition on what an invasive species is. So, you know, researchers might have been thinking about what it is and noticing that, yeah, there's some bad species, but that could also explain why a lot of this kind of went overlooked for a while. So <clears throat> what happened? Lionfish are really popular in the aquarium trade. And there was an aquarium in Miami that had a pair of lionfish. And by a pair, I mean a male and a male and a female. They had a pair of lionfish being Miami, much like the Houston area. They were hit by a hurricane and the aquarium flooded. The pair of lionfish got out, right? They flooded out into the Atlantic Ocean. So for 12 years, it seemed pretty localized. The populations weren't really getting too large, right? Thinking about invasive species weren't necessarily at the forefront of our minds over there. You know, it's one of those, okay, this isn't great, but what, what can we do? Well, unfortunately, though that pair of lionfish were able to establish here in Florida and then after 1997, they have been able to completely expand their range. They are now found all the way up from um, Philadelphia down to Venezuela. So they have completely taken over the South Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, down through Belize. They're found throughout the Caribbean. And so they have gone and they have spread all over and they've really taken off. And they also, so like I had mentioned, they have a voracious appetite, right? They, they will eat anything smaller than them. And the problem is that in our habitats, what they're eating are the fish that maintain our coral reefs. So the ones that remove all of that algae off of our living reefs, those fish are being eaten at a really quick pace. And now we're noticing coral reef die off because of the lionfish. And remember, it all came back to one pair of lionfish that started it all. And they've done studies showing that these populations all come back to that same Miami population back in the 1980s. So not only do invasive species cause harm, but they also spread. And this is why we have to battle them and be more proactive about them. <clears throat> so oftentimes, I mean, there is natural dispersal. That's what helps invasive species spread once they're in a new area. They can quickly spread because birds are carrying the seeds, you know, um, or if they're animals, right, the adults, the beetles are migrating to new plants, the hogs are walking over to the next county, right, all of this, they, they're able to move on their own. There's a very natural dispersal to invasive species, but sometimes we can't always explain expansion, like how did the zebra mussel get from the Caspian and Black Seas to North America? Right, that for something to naturally disperse like that, unless they were able to track that there is some certain kind of turn or certain Arctic bird that wants to constantly, it has a migratory pattern, that could easily be it. But that wasn't how the zebra mussel got here. It's usually because of human assistance. So we oftentimes help these alien or invasive species move along. And we do that by a lot of accidentals. So zebra mussel was one of those definite accidental ones. They came through ballast water. So because humans, we've been <clears throat> if you think about it, we've been importing and exporting goods since the beginning of time, since other civilizations were finding each other, right? You know, you had the Romans and Egyptians were trading and all of this stuff. So trade is a very human aspect, but unfortunately, we've been moving goods back and forth 
without thinking about what is hitchhiking along with them, right? What's coming in these packing materials? I mean, that's how the emerald ash borer came to North America. It was found in wooden pallets. It was just some larvae and adults were bored into the ash wood pallets. And that's how they got over here. It's just a lot of us not, not realizing how we're affecting the movement of invasive species. So moving flowers around, going hiking, right? Moving firewood. There's a lot of ways that we accidentally help the spread. And there's also a lot of ways that we have intentionally caused the spread of invasive species. Ornamental planting. So, um, you know, that that's caused a lot of the introduction for invasive species, the Chinese tallow, nandina, kudzu. I mean, you think about a lot of our really bad invasive plants. Most of it started because they were brought as an ornamental plant for sale, and then they became naturalized, and then they started to take over. However, there are sometimes people are introducing certain species to an area to control a problem. And this is where we're starting to correct our mistakes because a lot of people ask, well, why don't you release this insect or why don't you release this animal because it'll control this. But the thing is, humans and researchers, they were making mistakes for a long time, right? So we're not quick to release animals to solve a problem anymore because we need to make sure that it doesn't have a bigger impact itself. And one perfect example of that is the cane toad. So it was brought to Australia to solve an invasive problem over there. So they brought a toad that is native to Central and South America over to Australia. As you can see, this toad gets very large. Not only is it a large toad, it also secretes psychotropic chemicals. So it's that toad that secretes stuff that can cause hallucinations and a lot of issues. And unfortunately, that has had a really negative impact on all of Australia's native predators, right? They have a lot of important marsupial predators there that are trying to eat these psychotropic frogs and it's not going well. So now you've got these psychotropic frogs that can get up to, I mean, that, that, that picture alone, that's easily a, a foot long frog. So you've got these foot long frogs that cause hallucinations that were brought over to solve a problem and they're kind of solving it. But really what they're doing is reproducing with low mortality and they've now completely taken over. So now Australia has cane toad hunts because they're trying to correct the fact of that. So a lot of the times it's because we intentionally brought it over. Think about the grass carp that we use to manage hydrilla. A lot of that pets and aquariums, we already talked about the lionfish, but also think about the Burmese python in Florida, right? It all ties down to the pet and aquarium industry and biological controls, right? That's why the USDA is so much more conservative on releasing biological controls because we wanna make sure that we're not having any more negative impacts than what this invasive species is already doing. So here's a nice graphic to show how the zebra mussel would have gotten over here. A lot of our cargo ships, they need to take in ballast water to help keep their balance on these long movements across the ocean. So normally they take up ballast water at their home port. They go across the ocean to their other port and then they release that ballast water take up new water. So that's exactly how these species are getting spread. And that's exactly how the native, uh, I mean, the invasive zebra mussel was able to make that large jump, right, with human assistance. So now <clears throat> we have the zebra mussel has success, has really taken over a lot of the United States. So you've got here, it's first 10 years of distribution. It was pretty much localized. It did start in the Great Lakes. Um, that's where it was introduced. That's where the ballast water from the cargo ship was introduced. And so since then it has spread out from there and it does, it has since invaded Texas. It 
and we know we see a lot of those campaigns and that's really why cleaning draining and drying your boat is so important because just like a big cargo ship was able to bring them here our smaller boats are able to help them spread as well so <clears throat> when you think about what you look for in a useful landscape plant right it's easy to propagate it's got a lot of seeds it has a high germination success maybe it doesn't even need to be pollinated right asexual propagation it grows fast few or no pests bother it it's not really susceptible to a lot of diseases it's got a good color bright berries that's where we end up in a slippery slope because that's also characteristics of an invasive plant, right? An invasive plant grows with no problem, has a ton of seeds, can just usually reproduces. It also has the sexual flower reproduction, but it's got the rhizomes down at the bottom to where it quickly spreads again. So that's also why we've run into this invasive plant landscape industry issue is because what makes a successful landscaping plant is usually an invasive species because a lot of people want things that are low maintenance, easy to take care of and are pretty. And unfortunately, in um, kind of in that industry, we've been importing plants for a long time. So you'll notice there's a lot of contradictions out there. We're talking about how privet and legustrum have really negative consequences on the environment. Yet you can go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy them, or at least buy them online. So this Nandina, it's really hard to find how to manage Nandina. All, all the resources out there are talking about how to make your Nandina better, right? How to help it flourish. So there's a lot of contradictions out there. Lionfish, you can still buy them. They're still for sale. <laughs> they, they, they can still be put in your aquarium. I have had that talk with every I only have two friends that have lionfish and yes I am keeping an eye on them because I had the long talk with them about how you're going to have this animal until it passes and you are not releasing it into the wild anywhere that is not what a responsible pet owner does you wanted this pretty little thing now you get to keep it until it's time on earth is done that's just that's always me having my little talk because Think about all the pets that have been released and all of the issues that we have now. So, you know, we've got a lionfish control unit. We have divers actively out there removing them. Florida started a whole um, lionfish eating campaign, which actually it's a really delicious fish. So, I mean, if they can get the cooks out there, the chefs out there to at least prepare it, then it creates at least an industry for people to go and remove it from the Florida waters, but you can still buy them online, right? There's a lot of contradictions out there. So kind of touched on this, right? When do we notice? Is it too late? So we're getting a lot better about our lag time and things being too late. And we as in researchers, because if you think about it, at least these past 20 years, we have been looking for invasive species actively, at least 25 years, the past 30 years, before that, right, if you think about how things were handled in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, where there was a lot of, oh, we ran low on one of this animal, let's import another. We've learned a lot from that in the aspect of invasive species. And now we are trying to reduce our lag time. And that's why we have programs like Texas Invasives, these citizen scientist workshops, because all of you are going to leave a lot more aware of what an invasive species is, which means that you can talk to your friends about it, your children, your grandchildren, if you have them, right? Because children are really susceptible to this kind of, like they really take it in. They really understand these kinds of concepts. And so it's just that, 
creating more public knowledge can reduce our lag time because if you're letting us know, we can catch things early and that way we can be more proactive instead of reactive. A lot of our species, our invasive species, a lot of it is reactive, right? We're just trying to manage and control local infestations. So why Texas? I mean, because we're Texas, why not? But also because Texas is a really diverse state. There's about nine eco regions spanning from, you know, you've got the high desert and the Edward Plateau, then you've got down to El Paso, over in El Paso, and then you've got the Rio Grande Valley, which is huge for our ag has a huge variety of agricultural opportunities. And then you go into the coastal plains and the Blackland prairies. There's a lot of diversity here, which means that invasive species from a lot of different areas could find a habitat here, right? That because our state is so large and so varied, there's a lot of different species that can come in here. And so we also, you know, we share 38 about 3,800 miles of border with states. And then we've got a huge border with Mexico. We have an annual influx of migratory birds. You think about the whooping crane preserve down in Rockport and all of those migratory birds that come in. So we've got a lot of movement. We have a huge port system, one of the largest port systems for the United States. So if you think about, there are there are about three states that have the most invasive species. We've got California, Texas, and Florida. And if you think about it, it's all because there's a ton of international importation. That's how a lot of that is entering into our country, right? Those goods are coming through California, Texas, or Florida. So that's how a lot of these have entered into our state, right? So that's why Texas is, we're such a large state that we're really exposed to invasive species. And so we need to keep everyone kind of on guard and, and looking for them. So battling invasives. There's um, several ways that we try to do it. There's organizations like ours, like USDA APHIS that do a lot of effective work, right? They're trying to work on how to prevent invasive species. So you've got, you know, there's administrative committees that do a lot of education and responsive work. So you've got the National Invasive Species Council. We have our TIPSI here in Texas, the Texas Invasive Species Coordinating Committee or TISC not TISC, TISC, but just TISC. And then we, as we've mentioned a lot, we've got the USDA APHIS, which is Animal Plant Health Inspection Services. So APHIS is the one at customs. APHIS is the one going through all of the goods that are coming into the United States. They're set up at the airports. They're set up at the ports. They're all one of our lines of defense in detecting these species. You've got the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Texas Parks and Wildlife. And then, I mean, think about it even in your own area. You have the Woodlands Township Environmental Task Force. I mean, there is an active invasive species task force in your area. And that's how it even comes down to where we have these large national committees, these federal agencies, but we've got state agencies. And then it, it's really to empower everyone. Anyone can manage an invasive species and we need everyone's help. So there's a there's organizations, there's committees, and then that's where we're trying to put in more action, right? That's why we have import and export restrictions. That's why they inspect and surveil our goods. That's why the Texas Department of Agriculture has a noxious plants list. So there is there are some lists out there that will go over where states are able to prohibit certain species. And that's where a lot of the lag time can happen. Sometimes our legislature and what we know to be an invasive species don't always line up 
but we have the Texas Department of Ag noxious plant list. And then there is also a parks and wildlife prohibited plant list. So we've got regulations going on and each state has regulations. And then there are federal regulations as well. And then there are people like me that, and a lot of other people that do a lot more than me too, that we're doing the research on the impacts of the invasive species on the ecology, um, how best to detect them, to monitor them, looking at different control and management methods, biological controls, right? So there's that action part that we're trying to work well at. And then that leads into all of that research helps us figure out how to control and manage these invasive species and monitor them, monitor their spread and quickly react to it. And restoring the habitat afterwards, right? And, and that's something to definitely keep in mind when you're removing one species from the area, you've got to restore it, but think about what you're putting back. You don't wanna be like that street in Ohio where you're only restoring with one kind of species and then you're making it vulnerable. And then this outreach, talking about invasive species, well, doing early detection trainings, which this is what we're leading into today. Um, so Invaders of Texas is one example. And then you've got the Native Plant Diagnostic Network, the Vermont, Washington State, Oregon. I mean, the different states have different invasive species programs. You've got a lot of educational program like Don't Move Firewood and a ton of webinars that come from the Center of Invasive Species Management. And a lot of those are, are open to the public. And well, in a little bit, we'll talk about our, we produce a monthly newsletter and a lot of links to these educational programs are, are listed in our newsletter. So it's a way for you, the public can always check out because trust, trust us as, or trust me, um, invasive species biologists, we want to talk about invasive species. So we keep a lot of our events open to everybody a lot of public awareness, right? If, if we make the public more aware, that's why we've got had all of these, hello zebra mussels, goodbye Texas boating, hello giant salvinia, goodbye Texas lakes, don't move firewood, all of these quick campaigns, but it's because we need to make the public more aware because if someone's driving, they might be, hi, I've never heard of that. Let me Google it, right? And that's making one more person aware to where, oh, wow, I didn't realize what I do every weekend when I'm not draining and drying my boat, I didn't realize what I'm doing, right? It's to create healthier habits with us as well. So as I was talking about, we have an iWire monthly newsletter. I'll show you later on in the presentation where on our website that you can sign up for it. So we have oh, usually provide important updates. We like to do invasive species spotlights. So sometimes it's a, a well-known species. Sometimes it's a new one. We'll post webinars for other entities that are hosting things. We've got citizen scientist group features. So we have featured earlier this year, the Heartwood Invaders because they've been amazing at removing air potato in the woodlands. So we'll probably, I mean, I'd love to feature Kathy for another eyewire because I know she's been a, a really big spearhead for this, but you know, we feature citizen scientists across the state that are working on this as well, because it, it's important to, appreciate all the help that y'all are providing us as well. And then it'll list workshop schedules and our, our news um, letter editor, Kylie, she's really good at finding just really interesting information out there. Sometimes it's, you know, the progress on what we're learning on how to manage invasive species. And we as in a, a collective, we amongst researchers. So we've got our monthly eyewire that you can always sign up for. But so we talked about a lot of, you know, that we've got committees and agencies and campaigns and 
it takes a lot of research and management and monitoring, but it, what's really most important about this is you, right? Uh, the engaged citizen, the, the educated, the aware citizen, right? You're out there reporting or you're removing them from your own area, right? If, you, if you're even just removing them from your backyard, that's a win for us, right? If you if you get all that Chinese tallow out of your yard, great job. If you're able to start an initiative in your neighborhood, who knows, maybe you can make, put it on the HOA, right? No one can plant Chinese tallow, right? There's a lot of things that you can get involved with and do on your, and we, we as the scientists, like we depend on it. We were so appreciative of it because you're out there managing on a local level as well and helping us stay informed on where are you seeing it? Where are you removing it? And that kind of stuff. So it really comes down to citizen scientists helping as well, or engaged citizens of all, all kinds. What you can do, prevent dispersal, right? Do not take them for a ride. Early detection, preventing transport by humans. So detection, usually is trapping, monitoring, and vigilance. So we do a lot of the trapping and monitoring, but it's up to all of us to be vigilant. And that just means constant surveying, constantly looking for things, right? Like the Sentinel Pest Network, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But first we'll talk more about how we're gonna prevent transportation, right? Now that we're learning good habits, maybe you already employ these good habits and thank you if you do, but that's why we have these campaigns out there. Since humans are the ones that help spread invasive species, it's our responsibility to stop the spread, right? It, just like a lot of other things going on in our culture, it's up to us to stop the spread of invasive species. And that comes down to don't move firewood, clean, dry, dry your boat. The reason why we wouldn't want to move firewood is, and, and, and the thing is, if you absolutely have to move firewood, what's most important is you need to burn all of it where you brought it or you take it back with you. Don't move firewood and leave it there because we've got a lot of bark beetles out there. You're just giving insects a free ride. You're helping it spread. And moving firewood was a main contributor to helping the emerald ash borer spread. Right, and there's a lot of other bark beetles out there that we need to be concerned about. Cleaning and draining your boat is vitally important. That helps the spread of giant salvinia, hydrilla, zebra mussel. So taking that extra time and doing that really helps prevent the spread of several invasive species and preserves your, your lake for where you wanna go boating. So preventing transport, Right, so we worry, we need to worry about our terrestrial, right, and our aquatic settings. So these are, this is just a list of a few of the insects that can be transmitted. And this is invasive insects that can be transmitted by moving firewood. Emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn borer, red bay ambrosia beetle, gypsy moth, soapberry borer, brown fur longhorn beetle, cyrix wood wasp, right? That's just a few. And that's just a few invasive species. And that is just why we need to be really aware is all of these can hitch rides. And so that's why if you're traveling somewhere by the firewood that's there at the campsite, burn what you buy there. Don't take it back with you. Same thing. If you're buying firewood at your campsite, don't take it back with you. Leave it with some someone else at the campsite. Leave it, you know, because you could be bringing back pests to your area as well. So it goes both ways, right? So this is exactly why, as the firewood can carry the larval or adult, adult stages, these insects, like these wood boring beetles, their whole life surrounds boring into the wood of a tree. So that's why we have to be really careful. Sometimes you may not notice it, right? They may not be visible on the outside like this. What if they're bored well into the wood? They can survive weeks like that, especially if they're in a pupa stage, a pupa being that they're 
I mean, that's what they do. Pupa stages are there just waiting it out until they become an adult. So that's plenty of time for them to move to an area, move across the country, move across the continent, right? So really, really, please definitely don't try to bring any wood from out of state, but just be very aware. I, I don't even like the idea of wood moving across county lines, but it's just one of those being responsible. If you take it with you, you better you better leave with everything or burn everything you've got, but really try just support those local firewood producers when you're visiting an area. There's a lot of campaigns out there about it because it's exactly, it's, it's one of the easiest things that we can do to help stop the spread of invasive insects. So there are um, some Texas laws and policies to be aware of. They are working, they might start deregulating some of the emerald ash borer policies right now which not quite sure what that means and i mean it might mean that they'll start allowing the movement of some ash product but other states and then some of our counties in texas they've reduced they've done an ash quarantine where you can't move ash products uh, across state lines across county lines and that's just to prevent the spread of the emerald ash borer you um so even though the red imported fire ant is found in about 92% of our Texas counties, for those counties that are not infested, you cannot move stumps from a, a quarantine area. So that basically means most of Texas, you cannot move stumps into those clean counties, right? Those non corn because that's exactly how the red imported fire ant got here. It was living in the soil of some imported plants, and that's what started it all. So there are state and federal laws in place for some species, and we will talk about citrus quarantines at the end as well, because that might be something you've heard of going on in Montgomery County. Preventing aquatic. So a lot of it just again being aware right watercraft helps transport all of this i mean this is an obvious transportation of invasive species but zebra mussels are really small they're they're like the size of a thumbnail right the adults so the larvae are like these little microscopic creatures that like to float around in the water so if they're microscopic creatures it could be hard for you to see them on your boat. You might notice you know, like a small gathering of things, but that's why it's so important just to hose off your boat before you go, with, go anywhere else, right? Making sure that it's really dry before you put it in another body of water, because then you're helping dry out these creatures that we're concerned about as well. So it's just being aware while you're fishing, while you're hiking, while you're boating, right? Just using cleaning stations at these lakes that's why parks and wildlife has really amped a lot of that stuff up trying to make it um available to you to be able to use that's why those cleaning stations are there so please take advantage of them it's to prevent the spread of invasive species to the rest of our water bodies I mean, so it, it's not just us, it's everywhere, right? Everywhere is concerned about it. Everyone should be cleaning and draining and drying their boats, not just Texans. It's definitely a consistent campaign. So there are some Texas laws and policies. So there are some exotic plants, uh, exotic aquatic plants and animals listed. Parks and Wildlife does have a prohibited animal and plant list for aquatic, some aquatic species. And so it's really important that you are not in possession and or transporting any of those species. You must immediately dispose or um, of any harmful or potentially harmful aquatic plant that is clinging to your vehicle, watercraft, trailer. So the thing is, if you don't clean, drain, dry your boat and you're going, say you're leaving, I don't know, Lake Conroe, right? And you're heading home and an officer saw that you did not clean, drain, dry your boat, you can be issued a, a fine, you know, say the game warden or a parks and 
uh, Parks and Wildlife officer was able to, it's one of those like, you can be fined because it is state law that we should be removing any aquatic plant that is clinging or attached to a vessel, watercraft, trailer, motor vehicle, or other device used to transport or launch a vessel or watercraft. So if it's your watercraft, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're not moving things around, right? Please, please, plant natives. Get all those invasives out of your yard. Plant native species as well. So kind of overall on, on how they spread, they spread naturally, they spread with our help. They, they've made our biggest, their invasive species have made their biggest jumps with human help. And preventing their spread requires our vigilance and modified behavior, right? Being aware of what we're doing, not moving firewood, clean, draining, drying our watercraft equipment. And that's even being aware of when you're hiking, you know, pulling off any seeds that, you know, especially like sedge seeds and things like that, that could grip on you and easily spread and take over. Be aware of laws and policies. Quarantines are out there for a reason, not to inconvenience you, but it's actually to protect you or your crops or what you're being quarantined over. It's usually not, not in regards to that, but like citrus quarantines, those exist for a reason and it's to protect all of the other areas from being infested as well. But we'll get into more detail on citrus quarantines later, but just being aware of laws and policies and then please planting native, having native plants in your yard. So published in 2002, there was a study talking about how many invasive species are in Texas. This list has increased some over the years, but this is a good kind of just outline of a lot of it is plants, right? A, a good majority of it is plants, but the insects, that number is a lot higher now, but if you think about invasive species, we have a lot of plants and insects and mollusks are usually our main invasive species. Um, and by main ones, I mean like the most common or the, the ones we need to watch out for most consistently because a lot of the mammals that are here, I mean, they're here to stay, right? Like the feral hog, the nutria, please manage any that you see. But a lot of them, it's it's one of those, they're, they're found throughout the state. So looking out for our insects and our mollusks and the plants, that's a lot that you can do on a local level to help manage. Some of the worst of the worst that we have for our state, hydrilla, salt cedars, giant salvinia, the nutria, the red imported fire ant, the apple snails from the pomacea genus, and then the feral hog. Those are some of the worst in our state. And these can both be found online, right? You've got the Texas Parks and Wildlife Prohibited Aquatic and Exotic Species. So these are some of the plants that are listed on there. They have added animals on there as well, but you can see that, you know, you should, so they're saying that these ones are prohibited to be in possession and or distributing. So you shouldn't be in possession of salvinia, of any uh, water hyacinths, of water lettuce, Brazilian pepper tree. And it's not that it, if it's on your yard and it was already there, that's not what's illegal. But if you're trying to like sell and move these things around or further spread them around, that is what is illegal. But it's highly encouraged to please remove these. So those are some of the aquatic and exotic species that are prohibited by parks and wildlife. But then you also have the Texas Department of Ag plant list as well. That's some that are quarantined and or are noxious plants. So there is a lot of overlap, but then there is 
there is and there isn't a lot of overlap as well, which I know sounds confusing, but some things appear on both lists and some don't. And that kind of just gives you an idea of, right, that's that's the Department of Ag and Department of uh, Wildlife, right? And they're their lists, for the most part, have a lot of agreements, but sometimes something may threaten agriculture more than it threatens wildlife, so that could be why their lists vary some, but it's also important to keep in mind that if it's not listed on both, it can be hard, hard to regulate as well, and if it's not on a federal list, then it's hard to regulate outside of the state. Right, so that's where we run into a lot of our contradictions. But on this plant list, you know, you've got purple loose strife, water hyacinth, salvinia, deep rooted sedge, the Chinese tallow tree, right? So you shouldn't be moving those types of things around, Japanese climbing fern, China berry, or it shouldn't be moving those kinds of things around or selling them. So TexasInvasives.org started as a partnership between the Texas Forest Service, USDA APHIS, Parks and Wildlife, and others. A lot listed there. It's um, designed to present a coordinated approach to address invasive species through Texas. So this is what we do, right? We try to facilitate communication, implement a coordinated response. We pro provide a venue for sharing information about key invasive strategies. So even though we're gonna talk about quite a few invasive species in a little bit and how to manage them, you can always go to our website for information about other species we didn't discuss and how to manage them as well, because we really um, want to share that information with everyone and create public awareness for the problems. So this is just kind of an example, right? This is that invasive database that I was talking about. We've got plants, animals, insects, pathogens. Now that TISI, my organization is a part of it, we're going to be adding a lot more information onto this website as well. But most pages include a history how they spread, how you can manage it, and natives that look like them as well. So ours is a great identification resource. It's just an invasive database that we want to make sure that everyone's aware of. Okay, we made it. First five minute break. I hope everybody had a good five minute break. We'll go ahead and keep going. So now we're gonna talk more specifically about what the Invaders of Texas program is and more in depth on how that ties into texasinvasives.org. So the Invaders of Texas is an innovative campaign whereby volunteer citizen scientists are trained to detect and report invasive species in their community. So by no means are you obligated to sign up as a citizen scientist after this or during this presentation, but it's you've already got the training. It's really easy to register and you'll just kind of stay more informed, but we won't require anything of you if you don't want to, but it's really it's you. This program is about um, people like you that are learning about invasive species and that are getting trained to report and identify them. So it recognized that this program, like we've been talking about is, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough. I've been in the invasive species community for the past 10 years. So I came into with this mindset of it's vitally important to keep the public engaged. But Texas Invasives really started that a few years ago about how we need to, in, in, um, a few years before I got into invasive species, that is, that it's important to engage the public that getting these volunteer citizen scientists, they're, they're gonna be important to help report and detect and even manage the species in their communities because we're only so many eyes and so many boots in the ground. So this program has been around for 16 years and it's designed to move you beyond awareness into action on invasive species. So the first hour we, I made you aware of what invasive species are. Then we're gonna go into empowering you within identifying 
identification and management strategies. And then once you're registered as a citizen scientist, you can move forward and do whatever you want. And it covers all of Texas. And we do collect data from our invaders as well that we report to national databases that help keep that help them keep track of invasive species as well. Because these large national databases rely on state fed data and we're one of those state entities that can help provide data on where invasive species are in Texas and that's collected through citizens like you. So like I've kind of kept mentioning, the more trained eyes watching for invasive species, the better our chances of lessening or avoiding damage. So the more trained eyes we have over the years, I haven't been able to add in 2021 yet, but we've been able to increase that even more, including um, today but so since then we've trained almost 4,000 citizen scientists and it's through workshops like these that we've been able to train and that means that there is 8,000 sets of eye or 8,000 eyes out there helping us report and detect and remove them from an, a local area. So there are several different kinds of satellite groups. And then there's the Voyager mode. So your area will, and we'll get more into the registration aspect of it, but your area is called the Heartwood Invaders. But we have invader satellite groups from all over the state. And if you register as a satellite group, that's just how the data is collected. But whether you register as a satellite group or a voyager, which would be a solo, right? You're, you're voyaging out by yourself. Whether you're reporting the data with your group or as a voyager, we're still collecting all of that data and validating it and sending it. So it it's however you want to set this up is up to you but there is the heartwood invaders in your area that's done a lot of great reporting in the woodlands so where do we collect our data um, people filling out these citizen scientists reporting forms you can do that through our website or through our phone app we'll get into more details about those later but that's how we collect our data is through our website or our phone app and then we track the species observations submitted by volunteers you'll notice that in our reporting database it is very heavy towards the plants we're trying to increase our animal reporting but we've been able to get i mean we have amazing records on a lot of invasive plants throughout the state and so in our species pages there'll also be maps to the invasive invaders of texas maps as well on the web page on the page itself so you can also and also on our website if you're in the invasives database you can go to map invasives and you can look at some of the species that our citizen scientists have been tracking so you can get an idea of distribution and it'll even give you about the time like what year it was posted so you can kind of get a chronological like okay it was here in this area and then it's expanded out here but all of that is available on our website and it's also interactive and searchable by species or satellite. So you can choose what satellite group, or you can just choose the species that you're trying to look at. And it'll show as a point map, you can click on it, and then it can show you a picture for that was submitted for the report because all of these are observations. So there are photos associated with the points on the point maps. So that's stuff that you can click around and enjoy, but that is what our citizen scientists are helping contribute as well. So one example is how this is um, giant reed data that was collected by our citizen scientists and then we feed it to the early detection and distribution mapping system or ed maps and that's a national database that tracks invasive species of all kinds and so we feed that into there and so our data helps the national understanding as well because those national databases really depend on state fed data. 
So the Sentinel Pest Network, this is one that now we're getting into actual invasive species. So we talked about how vigilance is really important for all of us and that the Sentinel Pest Network fit into there. Well, now we'll get into a little bit more in depth on what the Sentinel Pest Network is. And it's a kind of like the really important pests on texasinvasives.org. So our Sentinel Pest Network is, was, it's focused on pests of high regulatory significance. And I'm sure you're like, well, aren't all invasive species? Now all invasive species cause harm, but some are of high regulatory significance. And what that means is it's really, really important for us to find them and prevent them because we already know these species cost us a lot of money. They harm our environment and they harm a whole lot of other things, right? So we already know that these are invasive species that need to be regulated. They need to be found quickly. So that's what these sentinel pests are, is these are, these are really important ones to find and report and just try to manage on a local species. We'll notice that some of the invasives that are on this list, they are already present in Texas, but it is important to report and manage on in your area. So a lot of these are plant pests that can create an economic impact on our nation's natural resources and agriculture. So they affect the nation's food supply or they uh, um, impede the ability to have safe trade of agricultural products or they threaten our trees and forests. So these are going to so our sentinel pests, these are also pests that it's really easy to report them to us because they are high priority. We want to make this available to anybody. So project partners on this are a lot of the same partners involved in texasinvasives.org, but we also have AgriLife Extension involved in there as well. So, and you, right? So it, it comes down to Anybody can report a sentinel pest, not just a citizen scientist, but we'll get more into reporting later. Right now, we'll get into where they are and what sentinel pests are. So there are some other identification resources. So I know I've talked a lot about how our website is really good at that as well. There's texasinvasives.org and then the TISI website is stoppinginvasives.org, but a lot of the data is similar. Our website might have more invasive animals, but Texas Invasive has a lot more information on invasive plants. So you can go to those. We manage both of them and eventually they'll become one big happy website that you'll find at Texas Invasives. But also HARC um, has a really great, the, the Houston Area Resource Council, they have a, a great quiet invasion ham, pamphlet that's out there. It's a booklet and it, covers and it, it's basically they have a digital version and then you can order booklets as well. It's an ID pamphlet on invasive species in our area. Um, so definitely the location of the woodlands, that would be, you know, the upper Texas coast as well. So they've got great resources there. You can go to this link, galvebayinvasives.org. That's another really good identification resource. There's also invasive.org. That's a good federal website as well. So the Sentinel Pest network, it's really easy to report an, um, anything in this group. So you don't have to go to the citizen site. You don't have to do any of that. It's this bar that's scrolling in the front, or you go to take action and click report it. So it's any of these pests or plants listed here. So it does not require a login to report it. So the Sentinel Pest, when it first was established, it was kind of considered a, a dirty dozen. And so it was it was a dozen plants and pests, so right of high regulatory significance that were listed because of the threat that they can cause and how important it is 
to catch them early. So it has a few insects. The top portion is insects. So you see we've got one, two, half of the dirty dozen were insects. And then you had five plants and one mollusk, the giant African land snail. So since that list was established, we have had a few of these dirty dozen appear in Texas. Now we do have the emerald ash borer, the cactus moth, and the tropical soda apple does seems to be making an appearance in our area as well. So since that list was originally formed, it's gone from the dirty dozen to like the terrible 24 or 25, right? It, the list has expanded. And that's just because there are more and more um, pests out there that we want you to be able to quickly report to us just their distribution. And this is information that we quickly send to Parks and Wildlife. So if you found a new location of zebra mussels or apple snails, all of those, we take that and we forward it along so that the state entities are aware of what's going on and then they can respond appropriately as well. So the list has expanded to where quite a few are present in Texas now, but we still have a few that aren't. But it's, it's really grown to include some fish now. We've got more plants, more beetles, but don't worry, we're not going over all 25 of these. No, it's just to show you that the Sentinel Pest Network has grown since we first thought of it. And it's really just so that you can quickly report any of these pests to us. So kind of just to summarize it, there's nine plants on there, four non-insect animals with three of those animals being mollusks, one is the lionfish, and then 11 insects are on there. So insects are still pretty heavy. They tend to be our biggest threat because it's easy for them to, it, plants and insects always seem to be our number ones because it's easy for them to spread. They can be really innocuous like we don't, we, or inconspicuous, we don't notice them. And so it's important for us to keep our eyes peeled. So now we're actually getting into some identification, some characteristics of species listed on the sentinel pests. So some of them will have this button up here, the original dirty dozen button. And so the first species that we have is the tropical spiderwort, which is from the genus Camelinia. And it's it, from the spider wart family. And I apologize in advance for dog sitting my friend's dog and she just saw my cats. Hold on a second. All right, so. Sorry about that. It's just, it's been a very interesting weekend in general. And yeah, the dog's very, very sweet, but she gets um, very excited whenever she sees my cats. <laughs> so my husband's on that now. So the first one we've got is the tropical spider wart. And it's from the spider wart family. It's native to Africa and Asia. And it was brought here um, like a lot of... Um, so out besides the ornamental industry and purposefully bringing them here, oftentimes there's seed contamination as well, which I know a lot of us are becoming a lot more aware of when ordering seeds. Be sure there are um, native seed companies in, um, in Texas, in America as well, that kind of ensure that there is no seed contamination, right? And we all remember last year with, I think right when COVID was starting, we were getting those random seed packets and things like that. Um, but that's how a lot of invasive plants have been introduced is they, they were just in a seed mix that got spread out, whether purposefully or accidentally, but it was first found in Florida in 1928. And right now it says uh, no Texas counties, but there could be an occasional report 
Um, we have gotten some, but we'll talk about the native species that this one actually looks like and can be confusing. So it is a federally listed noxious weed. So this is one that legislature does back up, right? And it's because it is one of those plants that completely overtakes a uh, habitat. And in its choice of habitats tends to be agricultural settings. So it will take over nurseries, crop fields. It is herbicide resistant and it does help spread root knot nematodes, megalodyne. So these root knot nematodes, they will embed themselves in the roots of certain ornamental crops and trees and they can really stress out the plant because they're I mean they're basically parasites in the roots drawing all of this extra nutrition and energy to themselves instead of to the plant so it can cause um, complete loss of crops and all of that so not only is this plant able to take over an area it's also able to introduce a soil parasite that doesn't harm it as much as it harms the area that it's introduced. It's a perennial plant and it gets about three feet high. It's fleshy, it has root set nodes, and it's branched. So the leaf blade is ovate to lance elliptic. So kind of like, you know, an arrow, not quite an arrowhead, but just like a teardrop shape. They're alternate in arrangement and they're about three inches to one inches wide and the entire leaf margin, there is a hairy surface and then, but what helps also identify, there is going to be red hairs on the margin of the leaves. So the, where it connects to the stem that's hidden here, there's going to be red hairs on the margin that will help. That's one um, characteristic of tropical spiderwort that's unique compared to our native species. So it does have um, aerial flowers. So it has the flowering form that's above ground. And then it does have closed flowers or subterranean flowers underground as well. So that also is what helps it spread is it has this whole subterranean survival mechanism. So it's important to get the whole plant out. So the, the aerial form is the one that we're really gonna see because it's the one above ground. They're bisexual and staminate. So it's usually got, I know in some photos, it can appear kind of bluish. So it says a lilac color. So it can be kind of blue. It can be kind of purple like here. But what's really important to note between that and our native species is it has really long pedicles, right? Kind of makes it almost like like it's got bug eyes sticking out or something, right? Or like looks like little mushroom caps almost. So it's got two purple petals on long pedicles, and then this is a white petal right underneath there, kind of forming this, right? You've got like the eyes and then almost a, a white mouth as well, and it's got some stamens there for pollination. So this is where, so even though it's called tropical spiderwort, it's in the genus Camelina. So it is actually in a day flower genus. So it can often be confused with the typical day flower, which is a native species that we do have here. So this dayflower species right here, it has two prominent petals and a third less prominent petal. So it comes, it's a very similar coloration. However, you'll notice those petals are a lot fuller and they don't have that long pedicle, right? They don't have that long connecting stem on them, which our invasive species does. Right, so they have much larger petals. They lack the reddish hairs, right? They don't have those leaf sheaf red hairs. 
So this is also another species. We've got the false day flower and the white mouth day flower you will see, see here. That coloration, right? That blue looks almost like the blue that we saw in the very first photo. But again, just remember those petals are significantly larger and they, they are native day flower species, have a lot more stamens, right? So a lot more pollen going on here. See here, they've got about five to there's like five in the center and three below and then our invasive species only seems to have about four or five pollinator stamens and and parts right so there's a lot more um pollinator stamen or pollen stamens in the center of the flower's face as well but this is a this is our invasive species and it does look like our native species and it's just because that common name can kind of mislead you where it yes it's a top tropical spider wart but technically it's um camelina and so it's a very similar genus or it's in the same genus as our day flowers so just remember the larger petals with the short pedicles they don't have the reddish hairs on the sheath as well so tropical spider wart please look out for that one on the list we have two invasive snails that are on the sentinel pest list and both have dramatically different lifestyles. So it can be easy to tell the difference between them depending on where you find them. So the apple snail is established in Texas. It's very well established in the Bear and Harris County areas. We are starting to get reports from Montgomery County. So please, please provide us with more information on that. We do have um, educational panels that we can put out to help um, reduce the populations, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the apple snail is an aquatic snail. It's fully aquatic. So you'll only find it in or around the water and it lays pink eggs around the water. And then we've got the giant African land snail. So this is the one you might've heard about in the news a couple of weeks ago when somebody had 18 of them in their suitcase trying to come back from Africa because they wanted to have them as pets or whatever their intentions were. That was highly illegal. This is a very prohibited species. So APHIS quickly caught that at customs and they were quickly, it was resolved because we do not have this species in Texas yet. It is in Florida and other parts of the Southeastern United States. So it's important that we don't get this one here as well. It's a terrestrial snail and it, it can be a very big crop pest. So these two live in different areas. They have different shaped shells, right? Our apple snail is more spiral while the African land snail is conical and it has striping that's always present on it. Looking for both life cycle stages. So this is actually gonna be the way that you find apple snails. Since the snails are fully aquatic, even though they're really big, they can be anywhere from about an inch to three inches large. And there are fully aquatic snails. So you can find them anywhere from a drainage ditch to um, bayous to lakes. They, they are pretty happy in most bodies of water. But since the adults are fully aquatic, it can be very hard for you to spot them. If you see bright pink eggs, and I mean this color pink, like bright pink, kind of a highlighter pink, that confirms that you have apple snails in that body of water because the eggs have to be laid out of the water. So while the adults are fully aquatic, the eggs must fully dry out in order to hatch and go back into the water. So oftentimes you'll see pink egg masses and that counts. You can take a picture of that and submit it to us as a report because no native species has bright pink eggs and that are laid by a body of water. But, but in general, there's no native species of gastropod or mollusk that lays bright pink eggs. So it's really easy to identify. Also, this is the educational um, 
sign that I was talking about that we did in collaboration with Parks and Wildlife and the Dallas Zoo. Basically to summarize it, if you see eggs, squish them, cut down that piece of, you know, it might be on a piece of reed, take that piece of reed, put it on the ground and squish it because that's at least reducing the populations. You're preventing all of those hundreds of eggs from becoming hundreds more adult snails that only will then grow more in the area. Also, it's really important to know it is illegal to sell apple snails in Texas. So if you do see any aquarium stores or things like that selling them, please report it to us. I'll talk about that later. But this is something that's really quick and effective that you can do if you see these pink snails, please, I mean, pink eggs, please squish them. And if you're interested in uh, us posting any signage in your area, we're just up there in Huntsville. So let me know and I can coordinate something as well. So there is a native species that can be uh, confused with the giant African land snail. And it's just because it's also a large snail. We all kind of get caught, I know I get caught off guard because we, we tend to think of our little, the little brown snails, you know, the ones that are like a, a third of an inch or, you know, they're, they're tiny little snails. So when we see anything bigger than that, we tend to go, oh my gosh, and we get startled. So the rosy wolf snail, it's an it's a native snail, but it is predatory. So if you're noticing it's throwing off the ecosystem in your backyard, feel free to remove it, right? If it's going out there and eating all of the other arthropods, right? It's eating your earthworms or anything. I mean, get rid of it, but it is a native species and it does not pose the same threats, right? That our invasive species does. The giant African land snail is a crop pest and it can transmit parasites. Actually, both of these species can transmit parasites to humans, which we'll talk about later. So, they're similarly shaped. They're kind of the same size in the beginning, but the rosy wolf snail only gets to about four inches. The giant African land snail can, at its smallest, is five inches. But while it's growing, it can easily overlap in size between these two snails, right? So what's also important to note is the the rosy wolf snail is called rosy for a reason. It's always, it's got a pink coloration in its shell. So it does not have the striping that a giant African land snail does. And it will always have a pink coloration. Next, one of our sentinel pests is the tropical soda apple. So this one is starting to make an appearance in Texas. It's from the nightshade family. So it does pose some of those risks that nightshade plants can. Um, it's thought that it's not quite sure how it spread, um, but it was first detected in Florida in 1998. It is native to South America. They think that maybe it was spread by livestock or livestock feed, something like that, they're, but they're not quite sure how it spread, but it has taken over all of Florida. And again, it's making appearances in Texas. So it's found in Angelina, Cass, Dallas, Henderson. There's been occasional reports in Montgomery, so that's something to definitely keep an eye out for. And this is some of the characteristics so you've got, it's got some really interesting looking fruit, some really gnarly thorns on it. There's even some thorns along the leaves, but we'll get into some of those characteristics in a second. So it is also a federally listed noxious weed. So it's um, illegal to have this, to sell it, to, um, so, and the reason is because it excludes desirable forage species. So it's one of those that it lowers the nutritional value of a pasture or a rangeland. The plant is poisonous to humans. It's a host for a variety of crop pathogens. So like the tropical spider wart that can transmit that nematode to plants, the tropical soda apple can bring pathogens with it that between 
in, insects feeding off of the soda apple than feeding off of the crop, it can quickly spread pathogens around and the prickly parts restrict wildlife movement. So you saw, I mean, it, it's pretty fiercely spiked up. So when it starts growing and it can grow into shrubs about six feet tall, that can really limit a lot of these animals that might be mig migrating through an open pasture or our rangeland animals on an enclosed range. So the stems and petioles are prickly and it has hairy, hairy leaves. All the surfaces are hairy. It's perennial in the tropics, annual and temperate areas. So it, it depends on how it feels here. It might be more annual here, but we tend to be in a weird subtropical area. So it's always interesting to see how these kinds of species act in areas like ours. So the leaf, it kind of is like a large, like maple leaf shaped, you know, just up to eight inches in length, six inches wide. It's got pointed lobed margins. What really helps make it distinctive, it does have thorns along that midrib. So there's some thorns right there, thorns along the midrib. And remember it does have all of those thorns here on the side as well. So it's a very, very prickly, angry plant. So it does bloom throughout the years. The, the flower or the corolla part there, it's white, the petals are recurved. So you see they bend back, bend backwards. They're five lobes, so there's five of them and there tend to be two or three flowers per cluster. The fruit, they're a sweet smelling berry, however, the, they are poisonous to humans. They just provide no nutritional stock to animals. Um, they do get dispersed by livestock and wildlife because there's a thousand berries per plant. And it, so there's a, I mean, sorry, there's a hundred berries per plant. So there are a hundred of these about one inch in diameter. And inside one of these berries is 400 seeds. So that's something like 40,000 seeds in one plant, right? So that's how it's able to just go to town. It's got plenty of animals eating it. Maybe it's getting caught up in the hay and the compost. That's easily how it could be spreading, right? And that's how it, it tends to happen is if you don't know what it is, well, then you're just going to go about your day and keep doing it. So say a farmer didn't know what it was, which that happens when something especially is new to an area, it gets rolled up in the hay, the hay gets sent around it, that hay then sits on other fields, and then the seeds start to germinate, right? That's, so it's been able to disperse with or without our help now, and it does have an extensive root system, and it can produce new shoots from root buds. So again, it, it it causes harm and it's able to spread and it's gonna be really persistent. Again, if, if, if invasive species were easy to manage, then we wouldn't be talking about them. So it can be really pervasive or persistent as well. It's important that you clean equipment, your vehicles, monitor your livestock. You can um, dig up the plant, especially if it's small, it's important to mow it before it fruits. Very important to just watch the fruit production if you see it. It is, um, this one is susceptible to herbicides. So you can use your glyphosate, your triclopyr, a lot of your, you know, regular herbicides. And there is um, a bacterial pathogen that is available if you were to find this. But there are, again, there are only some reports in Montgomery County. So ideally, if you do see this, you should be able to manage it between digging and herbicide. Next one is one of our more infamous ones, right? The emerald ash borer. So this is one of the original Dirty Dozen. This is one that costs the country up to $10 billion a year in management. So it's 
it's got a lot going on. And the way that it causes so much damage is its life cycle. So it's a wood boring beetle. And we have, I mean, there are hundreds of, I, this is a whole, there's a whole section of beetles that are just called wood boring beetles. So it's not the only one by any means, but this one is an invasive species that will attack healthy, sickly, any kind of ash tree. So it's not particular and it can destroy healthy trees, which is something that our native species tend not to do. Our native species tend to attack already sick or stressed trees. So you'll notice after a drought or wildfires, things like that, when the trees are already stressed is when our native species start picking up. But the emerald ash borer, it doesn't care. If you are an ash, it's coming for you. So it starts with adults emerging from one ash tree, flying to another to lay their eggs within, they burrow within to lay their eggs under the bark lining. The larva then grow and feed and create galleries along the, the under, inner bark and they can sometimes interrupt the phloem of the trees and then the larva eventually pupate. So this is what I was referencing earlier. Pupa is just that stage, like a cocoon for a butterfly, right? Where they're just waiting and they're, they're in this really solid phase, this solid cuticle where they're just waiting to become an adult. And this is usually the phase that is hidden in the firewood or things like that, where we're not noticing it because it's not moving, it's not active, right? It's waiting to pupate. So so this is usually the phase that gets spread around when we're moving around firewood and all like that. So the pupa then becomes an adult, which emerges and flies to a new tree and it starts all over again. So they can have um, one to two life cycles. They may even get up to three life cycles in a year. Okay, so they're quite small beetles, but there are two listed on the Sentinel Pest Network. Both of them are borer beetles. So they're actually both in the same genus, but their name tells you what they affect. So the emerald ash borer affects ash trees and the soapberry borer attract, affects soapberry trees. Some of the first signs and symptoms that you would notice would be canopy dieback. So where the tree is dying from the top down, you might also notice epicormic shoots. So these two signs alone could just imply that your tree is stressed, that something else is going on with it because canopy dieback, epicormic shoots are usually a pretty traditional sign that you're, you're tree is stressed where it's trying to regrow from the bottom but if you start noticing d-shaped exit holes and they're they're quite quite small but they're going to be d-shaped because that's the shape of these beetles right they've got a flat back on them so when they come out They'll have a D-shaped exit hole. So if you start noticing kind of sawdust gathering at the bottom of your tree, you're noticing these exit holes, the bark will start peeling off. It'll start showing some galleries behind it, just start sloughing off altogether and revealing that. It's important to note that if you are observing these, right, if you see these symptoms, canopy dieback, epicomic shoots, you've got D-shaped exit holes. I mean, the bark is sloughing off because of the larva galleries that are happening. It's very, very important to realize that tree is doomed. You have got to cut it down and mulch it immediately 
immediately. And when I say mulch, you need to make sure that it's finely mulching it because these beetles and their larvae are not that large. So it's important that you're doing a fine mulch so that you're destroying the insects inside them. And the reason it's just so important to do that is those adults are just waiting to get to another tree. So it's important to just cut down that tree, mulch it effectively and quickly. So a picture of both of these invasive beetles next to each other. So you've got the soapberry borer and the emerald ash borer. You'll notice they have a very similar overall appearance. These are bupressed beetles. So they tend to be bullet shaped is one way we refer to them. So the soapberry borer is a dark metallic black and it's got four dots on the elytra. The emerald ash borer, the name kind of implies it's got a bright metallic green color and they're both quite small. They're no larger than half an inch. So they're, they're small insects. This is always a good reference photo for EAB because you think about it, it's smaller than a penny and it's cost us $10 billion a year in damage. So the emerald ash borer looks like native species. We do have green bruprestids. We have native species that are the same genus as the emerald ash borer, but our species don't attack and kill healthy trees. What's the easiest way to tell the difference between a native species and the invasive EAB is this abdomen that is a purplish coppery red. This is the key to identifying it. No native species has an abdomen like that at all. There are native agrillus species out there. Now I know some of these photos, the coloration may look a little more coppery than it does green, but it, they're very iridescent beetles. So it kind of depends on the angle, but we do have native agrillus species that could kind of at first make you think, <gasps> but it's important to notice if you have the red abdomen and then also think about what tree are you seeing these beetles on, right? Emerald ash borers will only be found on fraxinous ash trees. So green ash, white ash, poplar ash, you name it, they're on an ash tree. But it's got to be in the Fraxinus genus. So actually, I think poplar ash doesn't count. So we've got these species here. This is on a hackberry tree. This will be on Robinia locust tree. This is not found on ash trees either. So it's always kind of important to remember where are you seeing the beetle on like on what kind of tree and then is that tree undergoing all of those symptoms we talked about, the canopy dieback, the epicormic roots, the bark sloughing off of it. There is a, so there is a native soapberry borer that we have as well. So you can't do that same trick with this one. This beetle you would find on the exact same tree. It's found on our soapberry trees but it does not have the damaging relationship that our invasive one was. What's important to note is our native one has a lot more white markings on it, right? The invasive one only has those four white dots on the back. The native one has a lot more white markings on it. So that's one easy way to tell the difference between the two. Like, okay, that's just the native one. But again, if your soapberry tree is starting to look stressed and all of it like that, I mean, the native species can cause problems, just not nearly to the extent as invasives. Another pest that we really need to keep our eyes out for it's it's appearing in Texas. It's the brown marmorated stink bug. It's a true bug. It's a shield bug. So it's a pentatomidae. So it, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I've already seen these guys before. Unfortunately, it is, when you first look at it, it's a pretty plain looking stink bug. So you could confuse it with others. 
and it's starting to make quite an appearance in the United States. So in this map, it has the red is where this pest is a significant agricultural problem. Orange is where they're an agricultural nuisance. Yellow is nuisance only and green means they've been detected and or intercepted. So this species has been detected in Collin, Dallas, Fort Bend, Harris and Montgomery counties. So it, it's yet to be a nuisance in our state, but in order to prevent that, we need a lot of vi vigilance. It was first detected in Pennsylvania. It, it's native to Asia, so the China Japan, Korea, Taiwan area. And it was a hitchhiker in solid wood packing material. And it's now found in most of the United States. So the reason it, it's a pest of high regulatory significance is because of the threat it poses to our agricultural industry. It can affect it can feed off of and destroy about 300 different kinds of plants. And that includes a lot of crops and ornamentals. So that's anything from apples to eggplants to tomato, asparagus, broccoli, cucumber, tomatillo. And then again, it can affect our ornamental trees as well has a big impact for forestry and agriculture. And it is a nuisance. So in those states where it's recorded as a nuisance, it's more of, it's not exactly destroying their crops, but it's severely impacting other facets, right? You can see this picture here. She is sweeping off an entire, her porch, like she's filling a bucket full of these stink bugs. So they can form you know, think about the, the plagues and all of that, right? All of the, if you think about locusts descending upon, now these aren't locusts, but they, they have that swarming ability as well, where they can just come in really, really large numbers. They enter into the house. So not only are they threatening everything else, they're also a nuisance as well. Much like true bugs, they go through several molts. They start as these really kind of cute little Halloween colored stink bug larvae. As they molt, they become more and more brown, a little bit more generic. You've got where the females are larger than the males. Now some of the helpful stuff, the stuff that'll help you identify it from our native stink bug species. So remember, this is an invasive species because it's able to quickly take over. It destroys a lot of crops. It reproduces and causes these swarms. So while, even though it looks pretty unassuming, it is quite problematic. So it's a shield shaped body, like a lot of our stink bugs, mottled gray brown. So the gray brown isn't really a good identification characteristic. But the fourth antenna band has a white band. So you see these white bands on the antenna. That is a really good characteristic right there. And then having the barred black and white. Overall, I mean, it, it's about the size of all of your other stink bugs. It's 15 to 17 millimeters. It's a brown gray. So overall, the coloration is kind of generic, but this is where you can start seeing some of the differences. So again, the white bands on the dark antenna is a really important feature. It has the distinct black and white pattern around the abdomen and a smooth shoulder. Here's one of the ones that looks most alike, the brown stink bug. So this is one, this is a native species we see in our yards almost all the time. What's really important to notice is it does not have the striped antennae. That's how you can really tell the difference between our normal stink bug and then the invasive one. Because other than that, a lot of that coloration is pretty similar. They both have smooth shoulders. They have the black and white markings on the back. 
but that striped antenna is gonna really go a long way. Here's a, another really common um, stink bug that we see as well, the rough stink bug. And here it's just ours, the invasive one has the smooth shoulder, right? No spines. This one, the rough stink bug has rough shoulders and it's even got teeth on its snout. So our, the invasive species does not. So there are just some distinguishing traits, thankfully. It's always really helpful when an invasive species has a distinguishing trait, but you might get it confused and that with our natives ones, and that's quite all right. Please still report it if you think you see it. Japanese climbing fern. So this one you'll probably you've probably seen throughout your area. It is pretty well established in Texas at this point. We still highly recommend doing whatever you can to remove it from an area. It's native to Japan. It was cultivated in Florida and it was for sale in nursery catalogs as early as 1888. By 1903, it was naturalized in Georgia. Now it's found throughout the Southeastern United States and it is still for sale on the internet, right? So it's one of those contradictions that we have. This is one of those vines. Um, so it's a climbing fern and it can climb the entire length of a tree and it will cover the ground, it will cover the trees and it will start forming these dense mats because it also has a rhizome root system. So it's not just a singular vine growing, right? It can start becoming this dense mat at the bottom that just grows up the tree, completely covering the tree, preventing it from getting any sunlight and it can intensify fires. It's basically, what do they call it? Um, ladder fuel, right? It helps make a ladder for the fire to go right up to the canopy of the tree. And that's when fires can be the most detrimental to our plants is when they or went to our trees is when they fully consume the entire canopy. And that's how they also really spread. So it is another one of those. It's a very unique looking organism. We don't, we have a few vines around here. You know, we have English ivy, we've got a few native species, we've got the honey, the trumpet creeper, the trumpet honeysuckle, we've got a few different kinds of climbing vines, but this is a fern and it does look, all of its leaf patterns will look significantly different from any native species. So when it first starts growing, it does have these very nice feathery finger-like projections um, to where the leaves are doubly compound. But you'll notice in these pictures, they will vary in appearance. So leaflets that grow on the stalks are lobed and the lower surfaces of the leaves are pubescent with short curved hairs. So so the longer, so the leaflets that are older will start growing into these lobed forms. So here you can see it's a mixture of where you've got the lobed form and then this nice lacy leaflet form starting as well. So it can be a mix of that and it will have an orange, it will have stems that can be orange or black or green, and they can be difficult to break. So that is also what allows it to spread is not only that it spreads by rhizomes, but they can be hard to physically pull and pull down as well. Crested and yellow floating hearts. So looking at these maps, they are starting to make an appearance in Texas. They're both native to Southeast Asia. And they were first brought here as ornamental um, plants for fish ponds. So they first started spreading. Um, the first one that was reported was the yellow floating heart. And this one is more widespread. And this was the one that was first detected in Winchester, Massachusetts in 1882. So this was the one that first escaped and started naturalizing. 
the crusted floating heart up here had more of the entry point around Florida and crested is potentially in our area, in the Montgomery County area and yellow floating heart is thought to be in North and Central Texas. So comparing these two invasive species, you'll notice they're in the same genus. So they have a lot of similar traits. They both um, have round heart-shaped floating leaves. However, the yellow floating heart here, it has heart-shaped leaves that are opposite. They're unequal in size with slightly wavy edges and the undersides are often purple. The crested floating heart has heart-shaped floating leaves that are alternate, unequal in size, and the, red, the edges are tinged red. So if you look in this picture, especially back here, you can see that red tint that just isn't present on the yellow floating heart. Of course, you do have the flowers to note as well, which we'll get a close up on that, but this is just comparing the leaves. So you can see the crested floating heart tends to have a larger leaf, but it will always have that reddish border. Here, that is a great way to tell the flowers apart. So this is a, a really important trait to notice for other aquatic plants that you might see that have white flowers. So for the crested floating heart, it's called crested because it has these crests along the center. So kind of along the center of the petal is this ruffled crest creating this 3D shape, right? You've, here it's coming on straight on. Here we see the crest from the sides, from the sides. So the, the five petals have fringed edges and a ruffle crest in the center of the petals. The yellow floating heart also has those fringed edges, but it does not have the ruffled crest, but it has a yellow flower, while this one has a crested flower. There is a native Nymphoides species, right? We've got our native big floating heart. That's where it's gonna be important to note that those crests, right? Our native flowers don't have a fringed edge. They, so they don't have those fringes going on at the edge. They don't have the crest. And those flowers tend to be clustered together while our invasive species, these flowers are solitary. So we've got solitary with crests and ruffles, and then we've got clustered without ruffles or fringe. Comparing the um, root system of the native species. So the native one, you might've heard it called a banana plant as, a, as well as the big floating heart. So the root system will also definitely tell you the difference between the native and invasive species. The invasive species have it where they're, I mean, they have very similar tuberous clusters for roots, but they're not these obvious like plantain banana shaped roots that our native species has, and they're not nearly as wide or long. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a, a good break. So we went over just now some uh, sentinel pests. So those are pests of high regulatory concern that anybody can report on using our website. Now we'll go into um, invasive plants in your area, um, how to identify a few of them. And then we'll talk about different management strategies on how to manage invasive plants as well. So there are a couple of pests that are not sentinel pests that as a parasitologist, I do want to talk to you about as well. 
The first one is the uh, black velvet leather leaf slug. So this is a slug that's native to South America, particularly the Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina area. It has migrated through South America. So it's invaded South throughout South America. It's gone through Central America and it's now being found in the United States. Ironically, it didn't get first documented in Texas, even though it's well established in Central America, it was first reported in Mobile, Alabama. Our institute knew this slug to kind of be around the San Antonio area, but it, it wasn't one of those things that was really on our radar so much as tracking its distribution until about six years ago when it showed up in Orange, Texas, which Orange, Texas is, sorry, cats, is way over here and almost to Louisiana. So to us, that was a significant jump. It went from Bear County over to Orange County, and we realized we really need to be tracking this. We need to ask citizens to help us track this species because it's very unique looking. Just like the name says, it is a black slug. It has a velvet texture and leather leaf is just part of the group that it's in where it means that the mantle is one a whole the whole length of the body so it's the same texture there are some slugs that'll be where they have a mantle and then a different texture not the black velvet leather leaf slug first of all we don't have any native species that are pure black we don't have any native species that are rough and velvety, much less black and velvety looking. So it's a very obvious species. We know it to carry parasitic nematodes as well. So that's why we really wanted to start tracking its distribution. We now know it to be present in about 50 counties across Texas. So it's well established in Houston, Austin, San Antonio, Corpus, and it's making quite an appearance in Brownsville the past year or two. We think that in the northern counties, it might not be as established, but it easily could be anywhere in between here. And I actually need to update this map. I did get some new county reports just last week. So this species is quickly spreading and it poses a significant threat to animals and humans by transmitting nematodes. So what do I mean by that, right? What, what am I talking about when I mean that they transmit nematodes? So there are certain parasites out there. There's tapeworms, there's amoebas, and then there's nematodes. So we talked about a nematode earlier that lived in the soil. Well, there are also other ones that live inside animals. And these are ones we're most familiar with. If you have animals, you might've heard of roundworms. Those are nematodes, right? And so this particular genus is called Angiostrongulus. And what Angiostrongulus nematodes do is they have a life cycle that mainly needs two animals. It needs a rat, and it needs some kind of mollusk. It could be a snail, it could be a slug. It's not very particular on what kind of mollusk, it just needs a mollusk to complete its life cycle. So traditionally speaking, these angiostrongulus worms, the adults are growing in the rat. You might've heard of rat lungworm. That's an angiostrongulus nematode, and it's called that because it lives in the lungs of rats. So what happens is you have these adult worms living in the lungs of rats. They're laying eggs. Those eggs are then getting laid out. Those eggs are then turning into larvae and getting laid out in the feces of the rats. So the rat, if it's infected, it's pooping out larvae as well. So you've got this first stage larva that's here in the poo, and that first stage is looking for a mollusk to complete its life cycle because these parasites need a rat and a mollusk. So the second stage larva find a mollusk, they penetrate it, or the mollusk usually ingests it because they're oftentimes near rat feces, or these larvae are mobile, they will move around, but these life cycles work because these animals are really close. They're often found in the same areas, right? 
So the second stage larva finds the mollusk and it molts into this third stage larva. I have that one red here because that's our infective stage. That's the stage that will then infect the rat. And the third stage larva would get in the rat, become an adult, go into the lungs, and then it continues the life cycle. That's the normal life cycle there. However, humans, and other animals often interrupt this life cycle. So other animals can get involved when they're eating the infected slug. So say it's a cat or a raccoon, an armadillo, right? Those are not the correct hosts for that nematode. So it won't react in them the same way, but it will still try to infect them. That's the same for humans. These angiostrongylus nematodes, they cannot survive in us. However, they will infect us and try to. We don't have the right chemicals. It's not fatal in us, but we can get infected. A lot of mammals can get infected. Horses, monkeys at the zoo in Florida have been infected by these parasites. So it's out there, it exists. And the way that we accidentally involve it, it comes in a, di a few different ways. So normally here, we're not eating giant snails or slugs. In some Asian countries, this is how they often come into contact with these parasites is they're eating raw or undercooked snails. And if you think about it, some of these snails, that that's a huge protein source. So you understand why they're eating it. But here, we're not eating snails or slugs. So we actually come into contact with these parasites in different ways. And a lot of it is just not being aware. So that's why I'm taking a moment to talk to y'all about it. So these worms are found in the slug slime trail of slugs and snails. So when you think about them climbing and sliming all over it, if they were to be infected, these microscopic nematode larvae would be in those slime trails. So in order for these nematodes to infect even a rat, they have to enter our di the digestive tract. So normally the rat eats the infected slug. That's how it works over here. For us, if we are handling an infected slug or snail, so that giant African land snail transmits this, the apple snail transmits this, the black velvet leather leaf slug transmits this parasite, the yellow garden slug pictured here, they all can transmit this parasite and things like the apple snail and the giant African land snail are big in the pet industry. So think about it. If you say that slug somehow was infected and then you're playing with it, your child's playing with it. Now we're all in a, we're still in a COVID world right now. So now we tend to think about washing our hands before touching our mouth. But this is a concern that we need to think about with children. If they're out there playing with slugs, if they're playing with an infected slug and that slime, and then we touch our mouth, enters our digestive tract. If you have an infected slug climbing all over your garden vegetables or your fruits, that's one way it can enter us as well. If you have, if you're eating raw or undercooked infected crustaceans. So these nematodes are really persistent. If they're in a mollusk and they become third stage, sometimes they will try and penetrate another host just to try and complete its life cycle. It doesn't do that to mammals. It'll just do it for these intermediate hosts because it's trying to find a mammal. So sometimes crustaceans will end up with these nematodes in them. So say it's one of those things, if it was out there, if you had a pond and say it had these nematodes in there and you ate those crawfish in that pond, and you ate them raw or undercooked, that's another way it can enter our digestive tract. So when they enter us, they either migrate towards our brain 
or towards our stomach. So it can seem as like a big headache or a lot of intestinal pain. What's important to remember, they cannot complete their life cycle in us. It is not fatal, but it can cause harm. I mean, they're migrating to our brains and to our stomach. Nothing good can happen. What's also really important to notice, it's very, very preventable. How do you prevent yourself from catching this nematode? Wash your hands before touching your mouth. Wash any garden vegetables you have, any fruits, and it's just a simple wash. You could buy a vegetable wash, a fruit wash, dilute it. It's just washing your hands with soap and water, it will wash away any larva that were there if you were handling an infected slug, if you were, if they were climbing all over your vegetables, right? It's easily preventable. Making sure that anything that you're eating is fully cooked, right? Don't try to do any raw or undercooked things. Oysters shouldn't be as susceptible. They don't tend to be in the same habitat as these, but it's one of those things that just, it's very, very preventable, but I need to take my time and let you all know that these parasites are in Texas. The hosts are here in Texas. So it means that it's just really important for us to be aware. If you do see any invasive slugs in your yard, please remove them from your yard right? And then just being really, really aware, just wash your hands before touching your mouth, making sure any crustaceans that you're eating, if they were locally sourced, just making sure everything is thoroughly cooked. Okay, that's it. It's not fatal, but it's very important to be aware of this because it is popping up. So the next pest, my final pest before we get into local plants is the hammerhead flatworm. This one has caught a lot of press recently because it's a very unique looking invasive species and it poses a very significant threat. So it's called the hammerhead flatworm because it is a flatworm with a hammer shaped head. So it almost looks like a hammerhead shark and a flatworm made a creature. It's native to Vietnam, but it has started invading outside of Vietnam as well. So a lot of the hammerhead flatworms tend to be in the bipallium genus. We in Texas, we have bipallium kewens, and then we have bipallium vagum that's starting to appear. They're both this, and there are other bipallium species found in the United States, and they were all brought here the same way, and they all posed the same threats. They are predators of earthworms. That is their main, that is what they do. They feed off of earthworms. So they can be found in your compost piles, underground, anywhere that prey would be present. And also they secrete neurotoxins as a defense mechanism. Now I know neurotoxin sounds really scary, but really what it is, it's a noxious chemical. So if they were to get consumed, they make their predator sick and they actually survive. I did receive a couple of calls from vet clinics saying, you know, a dog ate it and it threw it up in the clinic. The flatworm was able to survive. The dog felt unwell for a couple of days because it's noxious chemicals, right? That's its defense mechanism is to prevent itself from being eaten. So it's doing all it can to eat all of our earthworms, but it's also able to protect itself. What's also important to note is it's a flatworm, so it does not require a mate to reproduce. If you cut it, it will split in two. So it's very important that you remove this whole creature from your yard. You can pick it up, put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in the freezer. If you are not comfortable with it coming into your house, I understand. In that same Ziploc bag, you could just put salt and throw it away. But it's important to remove this creature because it will eat all of your earthworms. It entered through the greenhouse industry. So it was found as early as 1901 by pallium flatworms were. They were found as early as 1901 in greenhouses in Pennsylvania. 
then they started, you know, spreading amongst greenhouses. Cause if you think about it, plants are swapping back and forth, right? Greenhouse to greenhouse. Then they started being able to establish in natural habitats. And so now this species is found throughout the Southeastern United States up to Pennsylvania. So they've really been able to establish in temperate to subtropical areas. This species in particular, we knew it to be in the Houston area since about the 1980s, but it wasn't even late. If you think about it, right, invasive species weren't labeled in the United States till 1999 with the, right, the executive federal definition. So we weren't really aware, right? We knew these things were here. I have coworkers that remember growing up with them, but you didn't think much of it. Now we do know it to be well established in North and Central Texas as well. And that's because of a lot of press recently and involved citizens reporting it to us and getting engaged now because now we are the ones saying, no, this is an invasive species. Yes, it is very cool. Yes, you may have noticed it for the past 30 years, but just because it's been there doesn't mean it's okay that it's still there. We've got to protect our earthworms. Earthworms themselves are an introduced species, but the thing is our entire habitats are dependent, in North America at least, our forests, our crops, our gardens, everything is dependent on the nutrient cycling that earthworms and fungal communities do. So if we start having a predator removing our nutrient cyclers, it has a very significant impact on the health of all of our plant life. So this is another one. It's easy to identify and please remove it from your yard. So those chemicals that I'm talking about, it can cause skin irritation on humans, but I've only heard of maybe one or two people. And it was like, it can be anywhere from like a minor irritation to almost one person had like a poison ivy kind of reaction to it. But that's one out of like you know, thousands of people that I know that have dealt with them, right? But I just recommend using a stick to handle them just in case you are allergic to those chemicals. And please don't encourage your animals, even chickens. We don't want any animals eating these. So now some invasive plants that are found in your area. We're not going to go over all 10 of these, uh, but it's just a good list. We have already discussed the Japanese climbing fern. We are, of course, going to discuss the air potato because the Woodlands Task Force has an amazing initiative about that as well. But then we're going to discuss a few others that you've probably seen. You might have even grown up with these plants. I know I certainly did. And it's one of those now that I'm in the business, I realize, oh, that's what that is. So we've gone over in some of those other definitions, I was already throwing around some of those words. These are often what you're going to encounter when you're um, doing plant identification. They'll talk about leaf arrangements, whether they're alternate or opposite. So opposite means directly across, alternate means they are alternating sides that they're on. There's world where it goes around in a whirl. They have a Bunch of fun words for leaf margins. You've got palmate, scalloped. Then you've got the overall shape, chordate, referring to heart, elliptical, oblong. So there's a lot of different characteristics to get pretty comfortable with if you want to identify plants. But um, even though some of these things, the words are really intense, like try pinus pinna to sect. Whether I can't say that, I look at that picture and I'm like, oh, you know what? That reminds me of what Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo looks like. To me, that's a lace-like pattern. So feel free to, you know, print out your own images, get comfortable with these kinds of terms or name them your own way, right? So you know in your head, oh, okay, lobate. All right, that means a lot of lobes. So that looks kind of like oak leaves can be lobate unless they're live oak. So the first one we've got is the air potato. So right up here, we've got the scientific, scientific name. So Dioscoria bulbifera, bulbifera or dibu. So this four 
letter acronym right here is a plants database acronym. So plants, P-L-A-N-T-S is a USDA database that tracks invasive and native species, and it will provide um, location information and a lot of that as well and they have a classification system and it tends to be the first two letters of the scientific name so you're going to see this four letter acronym popping up a lot this is also the same acronym that you would use to report invasive plants through our platform as well and just it usually is the first two letters now if there is a repeat sometimes you might see a dibu three or and that's just because it's it's a different species that had the same four letter acronym, but it's just a different version. So that's important to notice too, because you'll notice that kind of repetition with ligustrums and things like that. So the air potato is a perennial deciduous vine. It's native to tropical Africa, Southern Asia, Northern Australia, and it's a high climbing vine. Um, it can climb up to 65 feet, probably even taller. I imagine it can go as, as much as, as the tree is if it wants to. So the leaves are alternate. They're about eight inches long. So they've got very large leaves and they're heart shaped on long petioles. So this is the reverse of it. But here's the front picture where it's a nice, it's a very, symmetrical heart shaped and they're on long petioles right so connecting to the vine and prominent veins meet at the base so it's talking about the veins on the leaves so they all come together to meet at the base so heart shaped veins meeting at the base big so they could resemble our native species the or a, a look-alike is greenbrier but these ones have much smaller leaves. So you notice it, it's not quite heart-shaped. It does have the prominent veins stemming from the base. But when we talked about air potato, we didn't mention any thorns. So greenbrier has a somewhat sim similar leaf shape and venation, but the size is wrong. And then also it has thorns present. Why it's also called air potato is because it has potato-like tubers on its leaf axles. It does also have underground tubers, which is what can make it very hard to remove. So here it spreads. Here is an air potato, just like was pictured up here. And then here we've got an infestation where it's just completely going up the entire height of this beautiful pine tree. So the tubers can get up to six inches in diameter as well. So they just invade, they take over, they start smothering. They also increase fire risk as well. So, so thankfully there are a few characteristics about this plant that make it really easy to identify and then as the Woodlands Task Force and Heartwood invaders are very familiar with, there is quite a bit of air potato in the Woodlands area as well. There is a beetle that is being released that is available as a biocontrol to help remove air potato. Um, I do know that we're applying for funding to see if we can help release those beetles. So we will definitely be in contact with your group about that moving forward. So there is an approved biocontrol for this. It just sometimes comes down to a matter of being able to actually um, release it in certain areas as well. So I touched on this, um, we've touched on this species a little bit earlier. So Neandina, it's a very, very common ornamental plant, almost, <laughs> almost like any house built from the 60s to 2000s has a Neandina or a heavenly bamboo plant in its yard. It's originally from China and Japan. It was brought as an ornamental because it, I mean, it has beautiful leaves. It's great seeds. It was brought in the 1800s. However, 
it doesn't stay in one area. It starts to take over, form dense thickets and outcompete. So it escaped from the ornamental industry and it's now naturalized. And it's become a problem in many states, including Texas, but this is one of those species that is still for sale on the internet. And like I had mentioned earlier, it's hard to find management practices. A lot of it is how to make it more vibrant as opposed to how to remove it from your yard. So it outcompetes native vegetation. It limits the food sources for wildlife. Um, and then it produces so many berries that they're easily spread by wildlife, but they can also spread by rhizomes. So you'll notice with a lot of invasive plants, they tend to have both strategies for reproduction, right? Because that that's an invasive plant strategy is, is to spread quickly. So that Nandina has lace-like leaves that are divided into oval leaflets. The new growth is pink or red. So that's what we were starting to see that, and that's really what made it an ornamental plant was this lovely new growth that's appearing that often uh, comes in around the fall or winter is when it can really turn to red. So it'll be pink or red and it'll become green. Sometimes it could be purplish, bronze. There's a lot of different varieties of Nandina out there as well, but it'll always have the lace-like pattern. It will change leaves. It will have these very bright red berries that form from these clusters of white and cream blossoms. So at the end of the spring, it'll start flowering and then you'll have those very bright red berries and then new growth will start appearing and it continues all over again. Japanese honeysuckle. This is one of those plants I grew up with. You know, I, I remember the school I went to, the one fence line used to have the honeysuckles and we always loved the, the smells and everything. So this is that really, really fragrant honeysuckle as the Japanese one. And it was introduced to North America in the early 1800s. I'm sure because it's a has a beautiful smell. They might have wanted to use it for other reasons, but best laid plans, right? It was brought over here and in the 1940s, it had spread south to the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plains. So it went from New England to the Ohio Valley, then it went to the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plains. And 1980s, it was over in Texas, all the way over to Washington. So it just really spent the last, you know, 130 years just spreading all over. And it does compete with our native coral honeysuckle, and it can resemble the invasive amur honeysuckle. So both of the invasive species are right here next to each other. The Japanese honeysuckle is um, definitely more invasive. It's more prevalent in Texas, but they do also have different lifestyles, um, well, different vegetative structures. So the Japanese honeysuckle really is a vine. It's a, it's a woody vine, but it's a vine that will start overtaking. The amur honeysuckle is actually more of a shrub. They have very similar flowers, but the amur honeysuckle is not as fragrant. The flowers start off as white and then they'll fade to a dark gold. These will flower white or pink and then turn to a yellow. So the flowerings are kind of different, but they both emerge in pairs from the leaf axles. So there's a lot of similarities between the two, but they are both invasive species. But the extremely fragrant one is the Japanese honeysuckle. comparing the fruits side by side. So they both have leaves that are opposite from one another. It's just the leaf shape is slightly different. These are more ovate, so rounder. These are elliptical to ovate, to even with long drawn out tips. So you see where that tip of the leaf just really gets drawn out. That's a different leaf shape than what's here on the honeysuckle, the Japanese honeysuckle. The amur, the, the fruits will be dark green and then they turn to a bright red while the Japanese honeysuckle has black 
glossy, smooth berries. The next one is the white mulberry. So Morris Alba or mole is its four, le four letter acronym. It's a perennial deciduous shrub tree. It's native to Asia, can grow up to about 50 feet. Its leaves are alternate, so alternating sides. It's polymorphic. So that means that the leaves change shape, which can be really fun if you're trying to identify a species. So that can be tricky. The leaves are anywhere from two to eight inches long. They are shiny with blunt teeth. So you can see those kind of blunt teeth where they're not so sharp. They're just blunt and they tend to have heart shaped bases. The fruit are like blackberry, but the colors vary from black to pink to white. And the male and female plants are separate. So this is an example of the leaf variation that you can see on one branch. But this can also help confirm that you do have a white mulberry tree because not every tree does this, right? Not every tree has a bunch of different looking leaves on it as well. So as the trees branch and mature, the leaves become less lobed. So, you know, the, the older branches are gonna have less lobed leaves on them. The newer growth is gonna have more lobes on them, but having that same variation on the same tree can also help confirm what you are, if that's a white mulberry. There are some lookalikes out there. You've got the paper mulberry right here. So it's got a lot of those similarly shaped lobe leaves like we see here, but they are densely gray pubescent. But this paper mulberry is also an invasive species. You've got the red mulberry. The leaves are larger and dull and they're rough. So it, and that's a native species. So Morris rubra. And then sassafras, we've got pictured here. This is also a native species. It does have polymorphic leaves as well. It has different variations where it's got one lobe, two lobe, or three lobe. However, that's all it will ever have. That's how you can help identify sassafras too, is if you see the one, the two, and the three lobes, as opposed to this where there's a lot more venation. There is a lot more than three lobes on these, right? Sassafras will never have more than three lobes. Giant ragweed, the leaves are opposite, not alternate. So opposite, green stems covered with white hairs. I mean, so, but it wouldn't, if you're allergic to ragweed, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to remove this out of your yard either, but those are some lookalikes. So we do have some invasives that resemble it, but we do have some natives that could be, um, so it's always important to check. You can always use a, a Google lens to double check your species and report it to us. So the next one is the deep rooted sedge which is native to south america it's one of those it was um introduced act you know intentionally slash accidentally it, it's often a contaminant in seeds so it's important to notice if there are going to be any sedge seeds if you're ordering um anything for uh your yard, your prairie, your pasture, whatever you have at home, just it's important to notice. Uh, so they are in the sedge family. It's native to South America. It's a perennial. It grows in robust loose clumps up to 40 inches tall. Of course, they're connected by rhizomes. That's what helps make them nice and invasive. The leaves are cross-sectionally V-shaped and glossy. The combs have Stems are strongly three-sided, so sedges have edges, so it's kind of one of those you'll notice a prominent side on them. And then they have those terminal inflorescence, so those little spikelets right here. 
So they'll have five to 11 globe shaped spike spikelets grouped together on six to eight bracts. So bracts supporting all of these spikelets, but they'll be nice and grouped together. This one is Cypernus entrianus. And so it's cyan two. So this is one of those ones where the cyan was repeated on another plant. So this species is cyan two, if you're looking it up on the plants database or wanting to report it. One of the most infamous <laughs> invasive species in our area is the Chinese tallow tree. So it's a perennial tree native to China and Taiwan. This is one of those trees. It was brought over as early as the mid 1700s as an ornamental plant. So it was brought before America was America. So it's really hard to counteract this species and what it's done, but it's really important to manage this one on a local level, wherever you can, um, you know, almost everyone has a Chinese tallow in their yard. So it's a deciduous tree that grows up to 60 feet in height. They have rhombic to ovate shaped leaves. What that means is they have pretty close to heart shaped leaves, heart shaped to diamond shaped leaves. So we've got that heart almost kite shaped if you think about it. it looks like a kite a diamond so we've got those kite shaped leaves and then we have their seed clusters here as well so the seeds are often a white fleshy fruit that are covered in a hard black shell which will open releasing the fleshy seeds they are known for being able to change their leaf color. So this picture just shows it. That's why they were brought over was not only for, I think they were looking for seed oil production, but for ornamental purposes. This is the one tree in our area that does the fall changing of the colors. So if you have a tree that has seeds like this and has really pretty fall colors and it has kite shaped leaves, you have a Chinese tallow and unfortunately it needs to be removed because it also is a really big competitor for pollinators because all of those seeds, it produces a lot of flowers and seeds. And the way that it's able to outcompete our native species is because those seeds are able to germinate in the soil for five, even seven years, right? So they can stay in the soil for a really long time. They produce a lot of these seeds. These actual seeds themselves are full of tannins. So they're found when these are found in an aquatic setting. So if they're lining your pond, a creek, a lake, and they're producing thousands and thousands of seeds and these tannin rich seeds and seed coverings are falling on the ground. They're falling in the water. They're changing the pH. They're changing the makeup of the soil of the water. And that's how Chinese tallow is able to spread so quickly. It makes the habitat better for itself to survive, its own species to survive. So this one is TRSE6, right? Because there's a lot of tri-Cs out there. So Chinese tallow is very prevalent and it's very, very pervasive. That's why it's one of the most infamous species. It could get confused with the redbud tree because redbuds, they do have more of that chordate shape almost rhombic, right? So, but they have very significant seed pods. So the combination between your Chinese tallow having that leaf shape and the seed pod structure, also it's highly likely you have one. So Chinese tallow is definitely a problem in our area. And so that is one of the final invasive plants and pests. That's, that's all we are talking about so if we for invasive species now we're going to get into management but before we get there i just want to do a quick recap this was our terrible 25 right here 24 25 
we actually talked about quite a few of them while we were here. We talked about 10 of those species, and then we also talked about several important invasive plants that are already in your area. So now, now that you know you have a great understanding of what invasive species are, how they spread, how we contribute to the spread, now you even under, you can even recognize now some invasive plants and pests in your area. Now it's time to manage <laughs> those invasive species, which is going to take a lot of vigilance and, and patience as well. Because again, if, if these species were easy to control, we wouldn't be talking about them. So managing inv invasive plants in particular, it's important to assess, treat, and so there and treat the area. So you assess what you have and then how best to treat it. There's several different ways um, to treat. There's cultural and preventative. So that's why we're always talking about plant native. You know, it's important to remove invasive plants as soon as they show up, because if you give them more time to get established, that just gives them more time to get established and where it makes it harder for you to be able to put it back to a native setting. Cultural, so thinking about, that's why we do certain growing cycles that farmers do that can reduce the amount of soil nematodes in the ground, education. So here, me talking to you about why Nandina is a problem, why you shouldn't have lingustrums in your backyard. Like, yes, they're great for pollinators, but there's so many native species out there that we couldn't be employing as well. So there's kind of that proactive, the cultural and preventative way to treat invasive species. But then we've got our, our very famous, the one that we're all probably more familiar with, which would be the mechanical. So pulling it, even wrenching it out using a weed wrench, which can be very good to get really stubborn weeds out. It's a great way to avoid herbicides. There's even grazing um, to where you could have animals graze to reduce the numbers or prescribed fires as well. chemical. This one, it's just, it's really, really important. Don't overuse and only use when needed, right? There's always, we have to worry about if you're spraying, is it a really windy day? Has it rained recently? Are you near an aquatic setting, right? There's a lot of things to factor in as well. So it's important if you are going to use a chemical approach that it's very focused and that you're following all the labels directions on the actual herbicide itself. There's several ways you can apply herbicide. One of my favorites is the cut and treat. And that's because it really focuses your application of herbicide. So it doesn't spray around what you're doing. And this is where it's really important. You are cutting and then you are immediately applying herbicide to that cut area. What tends to get us in trouble and by us, I mean any of us trying to manage invasive species in our backyard, what tends to be a problem is we wait too long between the cutting and the treatment. So it's really important that you are applying that herbicide within, I recommend within one minute, definitely no more than five minutes. You do not want to waste a lot of time because once you cut that tree, the tree is going to start regenerating and putting a protective layer over itself so that by the time you paint on the herbicide, it may not absorb it. So 
what we tend to do, and this might be how the Woodlands Task Force does it as well, is you have some people removing and then other people are applying the herbicide. So then it's a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am situation to where you are cutting and treating back to back. That's really the important part of that is cutting and treating back to back. With this one, it focuses the herbicide because you can use a paintbrush and literally paint the herbicide on. So it's really focused. It's not even spraying to the grass surrounding the area. We have foliar spray. So this is, you know, very cost effective as well. Sometimes depending on the label, you can you can directly apply foliar or basal sprays in your cut and treat. So you can use this type of spray, this type of herbicide that you normally would spray, you can paint it on the stump. So this is a, this is a good way if you've got like a large area where you know it, it's just all invasive species. It's a huge monoculture. And so uh, you can apply this one. It's definitely cost effective. Midsummer to fall is best, but it is important to note rainy periods because you don't want it washing away and also is it flowering is it seeding when is the best time to apply and then you can always make slight modifications where i like this where they put a milk jug at the end to kind of if that spray is going too far out that way it can help focus the spray to where you're really trying to apply it hack and squirt so this is stem injection. This more than likely will require an arborist. So you can use stem injection. There are two types of stem injection. You have stem injection for pesticides. So say you have, say your pine tree, pine tree, your pine tree is being overrun by bark beetles, but it's not the, but the tree is still healthy enough. You can see the bark beetles. That's when you can call an arborist and they can do stem pesticide injections. And that's where they are injecting the pesticide into the tree. It's killing the beetles, but it doesn't harm the tree. But then you also have stem injections where it's to manage the tree itself. So in regards to treating invasive trees like China berry, Chinese tallow, Brazilian pepper tree, all of these kinds, you can do hack and squirt as well, but it does usually require a professional for application. And that's, uh, so it's controlled. It's pretty much what it sounds like. You make hack marks, hacking either at the base of the trunk and then you inject in the herbicide. So this is also very good for selection as well, right? It focuses where your treatment is. So you've got different types. It's just important to note which ones. So you've got some that are foliar and soil active. So those might be better to paint on if you're doing a cut and treat. Some are just foliar. So you wouldn't want to use, you know, these are to be sprayed on the leaves. So you wouldn't want to use just a leaf spray on your trunk base alone, right? If you were just spraying the trunk. So it's just making sure that you're using the right spray for the right type of activity. Again, please use it sparingly, right? We don't wanna overuse. We wanna be really focused and effective if we're using herbicides or pesticides in our area. So we've talked about treatment. So we've got a plant and restore, but really there's gonna be a lot of retreatment. If they were a one and done kind of organism, we wouldn't be talking about them. So what comes after, right? You remove all of these species. It's really important to put native species in there before, because say you're able to clear out an acre of, of deep-rooted sedge, but then you left a half acre of it, well, then it could easily just repropagate in that area. So it's important when you're removing one that you have a rehabilitation plan set up as, as well. So 
So best management practices for invasive species. It's usually going to be an integrated pest management, right? Treat early, treat often. It might require mechanical and chemical. It Maybe there's a biological control out there. Is it available to you? Sometimes the development process is still happening before they're releasing it and just with chemical. Sometimes you might have to call a professional for the application. Licenses might be required. Please be aware of drift, wear protective gear, and you're going to need to monitor any seed bank or re-sprout, repeat the process, use that rehabilitation phase to plant natives, right? So it's really an integrated facet. You can't just do one thing. You have to do it all to really get a leg up. Thinking, think about what kind of plants you have, what kind of area it is, will also affect what kind of treatment you want to use on the plant. So an aquatic example would be the elephant ears. You would need to use an herbicide approved for aquatic use, and it usually requires a license. And it would also depend on where you're trying to treat. If this is on your own private land, of course you can. If it's somewhere in a public area, that might be up to the city, to the county, to the state on regulations. So you might have to contact the Department of Ag, Parks and Wildlife. And again, with aquatic settings, it's important to remember to use protective gear. Here it says, do not cut. And that's mainly because elephant ears have an irritating chemical inside of them. If you've ever gotten insulation on you, it feels a lot like that. That like really weirdly itchy kind of your skin slightly on fire, slightly scratch. It's, it's really irritating. So if you are, you can't hand pull these out of your yard if you're doing it in that kind of setting it's just really important to wear gloves herbicides tend to be more effective because they have a large tuber structure underground that if you don't pull that tuber out it'll just keep regenerating but again it's always important to think about it in an aquatic setting what's the best application then you have tree examples so like your china berry the cut and treat is really your best method. You can do a basal bark application, which is where you just apply a basal herbicide to the trunk. But I always recommend cut and paint on that herbicide. Um, you will want to chop up the tree, maybe get it going on a fire pile, but it's really important that when you cut that tree, you paint that stump really quickly because it will regenerate. It will start, if you, if you just cut it and leave it untreated, it will start regenerating. And then making sure if you're pulling up a bunch of seedlings, making sure you're getting that whole root system. So a lot of this um, with China Berry would be me mechanical and chemical is the best way. King Ranch Blue Stem is one of our most infamous grasses. So this is one that it helps spread as a mistake. So as the name suggests, it was developed down in King Ranch. It was an imported grass. It was developed in King Ranch for its really high roughage nutrient potential. Of course, it's a grass, it escaped. It doesn't recognize fence lines. And it got out, but at the time, everyone thought it was a really good grass. This was decades before we knew what an invasive species was. So back in the 70s, TxDOT released these seeds amongst the wildflower initiative and all of that that Ladybird had going on. They were also spreading King Ranch blue stem. So this is one of those very, very prevalent invasive species that spread directly from purposeful introduction by humans. So we released it in the 70s. By the 90s, we realized, oh no, 
this is not good. So this is a very difficult species to control, especially once it's established. It really is going to be a combination of herbicides and then cutting and tilling the soil when it's not flowering, repeating the treatment. But unfortunately, because it's a grass, it can grow amongst other native grasses. So it can be very hard to treat it alone without impacting the native plants. So early detection and treatment is ideal. Um, but again, it can be very hard. It, it definitely requires a mechanical and chemical approach to remove it. So it's just, again, assessing what environment you have, what kind of plant you're trying to remove and being aware of your surrounding environment as well. So we have got our final five minute break. We're gonna talk about the, for the last, Bit, we're just going to talk about how to register as a citizen scientist with Texas Invasives and then the pathway that all of your data takes and how to submit information. So we've got five minutes. It's 11.23. We'll come back at 11.28. All right, everybody, welcome back. That was our final break. We're in the, the last stretch of it. So really, this is just going to be about the data that we receive from you, how to submit it, how to register as a citizen scientist. Now that you've sat through all of this learning so much from me, which I truly appreciate you taking the time again. And then we will talk about a few more initiatives, touch on the Woodlands Task Force and open it up for questions. So with that, I'll keep going. So gathering data and website reporting on texasinvasives.org. So what's important about what you submit to us is we also share it with federal entities, national databases as well to help provide accurate information for Texas invasives across the country or for invasive species in Texas across the state. So there's two ways that you can do it. You can do a website submission or you can use our invasives species phone app, which we'll talk about just please don't, if you're trying to report a species, please don't trespass. Safety first, right? It, it is not worth your life to import, uh, report this invasive species. I have to make that call many times when I'm out in the field, I have to go, no, it's not worth my life to do this right now. So please remember safety first. Just point linear versus polygon. So that's talking about how much of it is an invasive species. A point is, is it one single point? So, you know, what is it one giant reed in a field? Is it a line of giant reed in a field? So that would be linear. Polygon, is it a mass? You know, like, is it a, a shape? Is it a polygon, right? A multi-sided shape? That would just be selecting what kind of distribution that invasive species is happening. More often than not, you'll be selecting polygon because usually it's, it's a, quite a mass that you're seeing. Locations are exact, so be aware of privacy issues. It is reported to us as coordinates, but say you're on some, so say somebody allows you on their property, but then they don't want you recording anything right? Everyone is entitled to their privacy. So it's just important to be aware of that when you're recording these locations. And that these pictures are for validation. So people have to be able to look at these photos and see them clearly enough to be able to identify them. So when taking a picture, 
Right now, the way our website's set up, only one picture can be submitted. So make it count, right? Make sure that it's a really good photo. Try to get a close up if you can. Landscape usually allows for a wider area for us to view. Capture the characteristics to help identify the plant. So that's where you can reference our website or Galveston Bay Invasives to see what are the identifying characteristics to help when you're taking a picture of this. And then a contrasting background is always, it, it's very helpful, especially if you know you have green on green or grass on grass, a contrasting background can really help our experts identify what you're submitting to us. So this is an example of like a fantastic photo, but this was submitted by an insect photographer. So by no means do we expect this kind of caliber, but it is a great example of a good photo. The insect is in focus. I have a contrasting background and I can see identifying characteristics, which in this case, this is the red streaked leafhopper. So the fact that I can see it's red streaked, it's legs clearly, I'm able to go, yes, I know that that's the invasive leafhopper species. This is not a good photo. Yes, when you're selecting what species to report, right, we've got that four letter acronym that you would be selecting. I could look at that acronym or our expert could, but this is, I mean, it's not in focus. It's not a close up. I think it's a china berry, but I we wouldn't we need to be able to confirm these things with a, a, a particular amount of certainty. And this we couldn't confirm with any certainty. So it's really important to make it close up, a contrasting background. Like this helps. It's still a little out of focus, but it's helping because I can see some of the venation. I can see the leaves are opposite from one another, right? There's certain characteristics that we can view to help confirm. This is even better because it's showing the leaves are nicely in focus. We've got berries for reference as well in case that. And then we have the size reference with the hand. This is also a really good photo. Again, the, the organism is in focus and because it was in focus, they were not aware of that. But me as the identifier, I'm able to say, okay, I see a full black collar on that flatworm. I'm able to confirm that as a different species. That's by pallium vagum, right? So making sure that they were just reporting a hammerhead flatworm, which yes, it is, but I'm able to tell which species it is because it's in focus. Again, Please, 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 and focus. That, that's really just what's important is making sure that you're submitting a good photo. And also we do have a size limit. So I think it's about two megabytes. So also remembering the size of the photo that you're trying to share. We're working on trying to upgrade some of that stuff. It's just that some of it, it takes hard to translate old technology to new talk, technology, but please remember to keep it in focus. So to recap, the sentinel pest network. So that first group of species we talked about before one of our breaks, these are the ones that you can quickly report. Anybody can report your mom, your sister, your niece, your nephew, anybody could click, come to our website and report about sentinel pests because these are the ones that are of high regulatory concern. So yes, they are well, some are well established in Texas, but it's really important for us to track it expanding so we can keep it at least to where it is and move forward on management. So you can just go to our website, texasinvasives.org. This is the home page, and it's right there, this scroll. So you can click the arrows to scroll and select which one you're, of our terrible 24 you're trying to report. You could also go to take action and click report it, and there's a list of it as well. Remember, it does not require login. Anybody can do that. You would fill out all of this information. We do need an email so then we know who to whom to contact to confirm or deny the sighting, right? You do need to upload a location and a, a photo down here, right? Confirm you are not a robot. And then it will come to us and we will 
go from there to confirm it or forward it along to experts. So that is how you can report on the Sentinel Pest. The Sentinel Pest Network reporting through the website. You can also report through our phone app. So it does have two different names. For, for iPhone, it's Texas Invaders. For Android, it's Texas Invasives. So this is a free phone app that you can download on your phone to help report organisms. You can access the Sentinel Pest Network through this the phone app. So this is the iPhone screen. Your, the Android layout is different, but overall it does have the same guidance to it to where it says Sentinel Pest Network report it. So that's where you would click to report that. Again, you don't need to log in. You can just download the app and report these species same way. The form, you fill it out, you still provide your information, location information and a photo, and then it gets con sent to us as well. So what about all of these plant species that we talked about that are not on the Sentinel Pest Network? So yeah, we talked about the tropical spiderwort, tropical soda apple, Japanese climbing fern. Those are Sentinel pests that you can report without logging in. But you now can register as a citizen scientist. So all of these other plant species that we talked about that are not on the Sentinel Pest Network, you can register as a citizen scientist, create an account, and you can report it all through the website, through your phone. And so the way we'll do that is go ahead and write down or go to this um, webpage on your phone, or I mean on your laptop, but it's go to this, write it down exactly. And then I'll show you just like the step-by-step. -step. This link takes you exactly to where registration for a citizen scientist workshop happens. So this is what you do at the end of the workshop. And it'll also set up your account. So it'll look like this if you go there. So it, it's creating your Invaders of Texas citizen scientist account. Choose a login name and password. Please be sure to write it down. But if you forget any of it, you can email us I'll sh at the invasives at shsu.edu. There are instructions there. You can email us for password and username recovery. So you would choose your login name and password. And this is where you can choose your satellite group. So like I talked about earlier, where you could register as a satellite or as a Voyager, your area has a satellite group. It's the Heartwood Invaders. So you would select that, just fill out your information, do the I'm not a robot recaptcha test. And that's it. You'll be registered as a citizen scientist, which means that you can now report you can log in on our website and report on different invasive plants on the area. Once we start expanding our other reporting capabilities, you'll be able to have access to all of that as well. You would wanna enter in um, your coordinates. You can keep it, um, you can keep your location generic. It doesn't have to be your exact house. It could be the cul-de-sac. It could be a nearby intersection. That's up to you, but we do want your location, you know, at least in like Montgomery County or, or North Harris, right? Somewhere that represents where you actually are. But if you're not comfortable with it being your exact coordinates, it doesn't have to be right. But please keep it, you know, don't say that you're a Heartwood invader, but you live your locations in Lubbock. Just keep it somewhat regional. Complete the security step click create your profile and then you'll have a citizen scientist account page and this is where you um, would be able to add observations you'll see if your observations have been validated or not you can edit your profile from there so it's it's as easy as that I'll put the link up there one more time. Just be sure, uh, watch for autocomplete. Make sure that you're going to HTTP semicolon backslash backslash, backslash www.texasinvasives.org slash workshop slash. And that's where the registration form is. 
if you want to register as a citizen scientist. Then if you want to report on the website, you would click the citizen scientist tab on the home page. You would go to login and report. And it'll take you to your page and it'll allow you to report. Or if you have the phone app, you would just click on login. And that's if you're reporting something that's not on the Sentinel Pest Network, right? You would log in and you'd be able to report it there as well. You would click on, you could click on species by character. So it'll show you, if you wanna look at all the species that are listed, it will show you here if you can report on it or not. A lot of the reporting capability is focused on plants at this time. Most of the pests that you would be able to report would be through the Sentinel Pest Network, which does not require logging in, but there is a lot. We have a lot of reporting options for many invasive plants available through the app and through the website. And that's all stuff that we are working on continuing to maintain and expand upon as well. So just to submit it, and observation of an invasive plant, you would click report and you would upload the photo and you would go from there, just like we talked about the Sentinel Pest Network to remember it doesn't require a login. You would just click that and click on your pest. What about if it's neither of those? <laughs> what if I can't report it through the app or the website? but it is listed or it, I found it on the, the TISI website. What, what about other species to report? You can always email us at invasives at shsu.edu. You can always report invasive species in Texas to us there. If you're not able to do it through the Sentinel Pest Network or the citizen scientists reporting, we will take the data however we can. And we strongly encourage you. So this is where we, you know, I talked about our lovely monthly iWire. This is where you can sign up to stay informed. It's on our website. You would go to the take action tab and it's right there saying, keep informed. You sign up. We only send once a month iWires. Um, if anything, if there was a specialty feature, you might get two emails in a month, but that is it. We do not share the emails with anybody else. That is for us to help you stay informed again about everything that's going on in invasive species and you never know your group could be featured in the monthly iWire. So to kind of wrap it up, there are a couple of other initiatives that I want to touch on at texasinvasives.org. Please feel free to reach out after this workshop. Let Terry know or myself know um, if you're interested in these uh, other initiatives. One of them I touched on a little bit is citrus greening. So we talked a little bit about there was some quarantines going on. So citrus greening is a plant pathogen that attacks only citrus trees. Native to Southeast Asia, first found in Florida, it has caused problems in Florida. It's now found in Texas. It was first found in the Rio Grande Valley. So it's a plant pathogen that's transmitted by a psyllid or a phloem feeding insect. So it has now led to citrus quarantines in not only where citrus production actually happens, which is limited to the Rio Grande Valley, but also where we have backyard citrus trees. So this is something that we really need to be aware of is backyard citrus trees are just as susceptible as catching the psyllid feed letting the psyllid feed off of it and then catching the citrus greening and allowing it to spread almost think of it as creating a highway to our citrus production so it's really important that backyard citrus growers we need to start being aware of what's going on with our citrus trees that's why we've actually started um, this education and outreach focused program about citrus greening some symptoms you might notice is you're going to notice they're going to be large. They're not aphids. They're kind of like a leaf hopper, but they're going to have multiple stages, right? You've got the larval stage, the adult stage. The larvae make these waxy white secretions. This is a very strong indicator of psyllid presence. 
citrus greening itself, which is transmitted by this psyllid, it will cause the tree to die within a few years. It basically removes the greening. So your tree will start getting yellower. The fruit asymmetrical, misshapen, green, bitter, unsuitable for sale or juice. So it destroys the product as well. So we're actually doing outreach initiatives where you can contact us if you want to schedule a workshop where we go a little bit more in depth about what citrus greening is, what the Asian citrus psyllid does, why it's important to adhere to these quarantines, because in Montgomery County, you might have seen citrus quarantine signs. And that's basically because we need to limit the transportation we don't want to spread the psyllid around. If that insect is going around, it can spread the pathogen wherever it wants to. So we've really got to limit the spread. We're even establishing, we can help with trapping efforts to help you identify it, confirm citrus greening, and maybe even get you in contact with the department, Texas Department of Ag to see if you're interested in biocontrol methods. So we're really trying to build up some workshops focused on that. That's one of our initiatives. And then we also have the Aquarium Watch. This is really important. We're trying to hold aquarium stores accountable for what they are selling. Remember, we went over a list. There are lists of prohibited species, right? So there are certain things that our pet shops, our aquarium shops should not be selling. So if you are interested in this, please email me at invasives at shsu.edu. Title it Aquarium Watch. Just let me know and I'll give you more instructions, but pretty much we just want you to go to aquarium store. If you see anything that is for sale that shouldn't be for sale, which we, that's why you contact us. We'll give you a list of the species. The species are right here. So we'll give you a list of these species. You would go to the store, take a picture of them selling it report your finding to us, and then we will get in contact with Parks and Wildlife and the game wardens to help hold these stores accountable because they should not be selling it if it's a prohibited species. So a few of them, there are some plants that we're worried about, common salvinia, giant salvinia, right? We don't want anybody selling those floating hearts that we talked about, giant reed, water, le water le lettuce, I can say the word water lettuce. We don't want anybody selling that. We've got our armored sucker mouth catfish, which those are famous from the aquarium industry. They've now taken over the, our bayous and they cause major erosion. So there's several species that we want to look out for. And it's important for us to stay vigilant because even when the stores are trying their best, Sometimes they're accidentally selling invasive species as well. There were zebra mussels found in moss balls at aquarium stores. So that's where if you can help us spot ones that are blatantly not supposed to be sold, that can really help us out. So if you're interested, you would just email um, invasives at SHSU, title it Aquarium Watch. I'll give you more guidance. And really, you just got to go and take pictures and keep us posted. So the group that brought us all here together, the Invasives Task Force with the Woodlands Township, contact is Terry MacArthur. She, her email address is here below. So if you are interested, if you don't have this information, if this is your first time hearing about it, please, please write it down. But they are a wonderful organization that's done a lot of great work. Um, Groups like this task force really invigor invigorate uh, invasive species biologists like myself, because as I just talked to you for the first past four hours, you know, it it's an uphill battle trying to deal with invasive species. Some of them have hundreds of years on them. Some of them, they're more resistant to anything that we could put at them. But hearing groups that are out there, that are engaged, that they're really making a difference in their area, it's encouraging. This is exactly why we do it. Because yeah, as a big picture, it may seem like something insurmountable, but on a local level, we're really making differences. So please, please get more involved with the 
Invasives Task Force at the Woodlands Township and then help us stop the spread of invasive species. You can go, remember you can report sentinel pests straight at the texasinvasives.org website. That's also where you, if you registered as a citizen scientist, you can now report other species through there. If you wanna email other sightings or schedule a citrus screening workshop, or you want to do the aquarium watch, please, please email us at invasives at SHSU. And thank you. With that, I have some time for questions. Well, that was a lot to take in today, Ashley. Thank you so much for such a terrific workshop. Uh, we do have a few questions and they are mostly about management issues. Um, so in your estimation or knowledge of what groups uh, around the state are doing, if an area is really heavily infested with invasive species, do you have a sense that the best thing could just be to totally clear the area and start over with replanting? I mean, that's that's honestly not a bad idea. Yeah, say you have several acres that, I mean, you genuinely know it's all bastard cabbage and um, you know, species that provide just no value or nutritional value to the area, sometimes that might be the best is just to completely try to dig it all out, get it all out and start over. Yeah, do that instant rehabilitation where you get those native seeds in and try to build up from there. Would you suggest that whether it's totally cleared or in spots cleared out, do you recommend that it would be a good idea at all to take a soil sample at that point while it's easily possible to get a good soil sample just to see if there's um, any particular uh, needs that that soil might have that, to strengthen the microbial community to help prevent some regrowth? That that is a great idea um, because those invasive plants could have changed the soil structure to benefit them. So maybe it's low in nitrogen or, or something like that, which could impact the success of your, your native species. So that's not a bad idea at all. You could probably get that soil sample. I would say do it kind of before you start clearing everything because you know you don't you don't want to clear it. And then you're waiting a while for the results of your soil sample, right? You, you would wanna get that soil sample kind of out and processed. So then by the time you're clearing, you already know what you need to put into that soil to help those seeds, those native seeds really take, take hold. And that, that's a great question. That's a great idea. Definitely assessing, you know, how did they alter it? What, what should your soil look like? right, for native plant success. Great, great, great answer. Thank you so much. Um, and when it comes to replanting, I'm, I'm already certain your answer is going to be, yes, we should be replacing these with native species. Yes, yes, highly, highly recommended. Please plant with native species. Um, I mean, it's just what's what's really, really important. So, you know, I I understand there are ornamental plants for a reason. What's really important is just making sure if you are bringing a plant into your yard, make sure it's not listed on our website as an actual invasive species. But yes, we always encourage native plants, grasses, trees, pollinator, attractants, everything. Just please um, replant quickly and with native species. But if you have to, just make sure you're planting a true ornamental species that is not invasive, right? That's, that's where it's like, you got to be 100% certain. So just go with native. <laughs> so with your permission, Ashley, I see Kathy Herrick is still with us. Um, I was thinking we might ask her to unmute because there were uh, were a couple of questions about um, the 
follow up for air potato vine. Uh, Kathy, would you mind just briefly describing to us if you're there about uh, how many times would you say on average you have to return to check? Uh, we go back at, hopefully we solve the problem in about three years. And we've totally depended on mechanical uh, removal. But we, it isn't, like Ashley said, it's not a one and done. Uh, it, we, it may be an annual visit. It may be, uh, you know, three or four times a year, the first year, and then we can go one time in subsequent years. But, uh, and we're, all, we're, right now, we're just limited to four villages. We haven't had reports from other villages. So. And uh, Kathy, so when you're out there, are you only removing the vine itself or what else are you looking for? Oh, we, we go underground. Um, the idea is to remove the tuber uh, underground. And sometimes it's hard to find when it's a dense thicket. Um, and that's definitely will imply that we'll go back when we can uh, get it as it's emerging after we've cleared and we can see where we need to dig. And at this time of year, those bulbs are forming and we want to get everything out of the trees so that the bulbs don't develop and create the next generation. Okay, so back to, thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. Uh, back to... Ashley then. Ashley and Archie. Sorry. My my cat is making an appearance. I'm surprised he held off as long. I, yeah, I did receive a couple of questions directly. Um, so yeah, Kathy, on note of the, the air potato vine beetles, yeah, we're hoping. I put it in the proposal that your group is working with it. So hopefully if we get that funding, we can coordinate some release with y'all. I do know that those beetles, yeah, they are for sale. Um, I, so I think they're like one of those approved biocontrols so it's one of those things with biocontrols in general, it, it often takes a lot of time for them to get released. So these ones you should be able to buy, but we're also, if we get funding, we're going to help coordinate that because that's also sometimes what delays a release too. Yeah, we've got these, you know, giant salvinia weevils or Brazilian pepper tree thrips, but getting them out costs money as well. But we'll definitely be in touch with that. Are all varieties of Lingustrum and Nandina plants invasive? the overall question the overall answer is yes um some might some hybrids might be less invasive than others but they're all you know your chinese privet your japanese privet they're very very invasive there might be some that are are less invasive but they still do the same thing where they start taking over and forming monocultures and monopolizing the pollinators and all of that kind of stuff and then um after reporting, what does Texas do to remove? So reporting, a lot of it comes down to is us tracking it. Removal, if it's um, something on your area, you know, this is what we strongly encourage and are empowering you to please remove invasive species at your area. But some of those pests of higher concern um, like the zebra mussel and giant salvinia and all of that. Parks and Wildlife has their own management program set up to where they would go out and then try to release weevils or grass carp or whatever they need to to help manage it at that area. So there's a lot of different approaches, but sometimes just knowing where it is it is, is as far as it can go because we really need like you to remove it at your area. We can only, Texas is too large for us to go out and there's too many invasive species for us as the state and federal entities to go out and remove. But there are, you know, there's cooperative weed management areas that focus on removal. So there are a lot of different initiatives focused on different invasive species. And by reporting that information to us, we can let them know, hey, this species is here, this species is here, add it into your management program. Okay, 
all thank you've got some thank yous about adding this page to your favorites i appreciate that yes the black slugs are all throughout montgomery county they are pretty well established that was a great question just now can the nematode larva survive in dried slug slime and the answer is not really especially with all of these heat all this heat pretty much if the slime is dried so would the nematodes but but to ensure but um if you even just kind of pressure wash the area or do a little bit of diluted bleach spray clorox wipe you know say the slug got in your house clorox wipe those areas where you see slime trails that will kill um any chance of larva there then let's see um so vines are taking over our pine trees how can they be removed so if they're really high up it can be you can't just necessarily pull them down um so a lot of it can be kind of that cut and treat where you are cutting the vine around your pine tree so you're you're basically killing that top part because it's no longer attached to the where the roots where it's getting all of its nutrients and then you could pull it down or you could try to do some cut and treat where you cut the vines and then use the paintbrush to paint on those vines to make sure that it's not getting absorbed by the pine tree as much but that can be a way to where you can at least kill the top portion to make it easier to remove it down and then I think, ba, 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 ba. and then that's, those are all the questions that I have. So those were really good questions. Does anybody have anything else? I um, shamelessly put the website for you to find other offerings, other educational offerings by environmental services. It's in your chat window. So you know copy that and um use it to see what else you can learn from some of the classes and events at uh, env that environmental services offers and i'm not seeing any more questions here so thank you all so much for spending the morning with ashley and me she's been wonderful and i know we all learned so much i hope to hear from you if you check the box that you wanted to be contact about work days I'll send your email address to Kathy Herrick. So watch for emails from her inviting you to future work days. Thank you again, Ashley. It was a terrific morning. Appreciate you taking the time. Bye everybody. Thank you all so much. Bye.